True story. Eight years ago, I ordered a custom bow from a, a, a reputable bow manufacturer all the way across the country. We talked a couple times, talked about woods and styles, and, and then we settled on uh, what I was looking for, gave him my specs, and uh, paid my down payment. Seven months later, the bow was ready. I paid in full. He shipped me the bow. I hated it the minute it came out of the box. It didn't look good. It didn't feel right, and it didn't shoot good. I ended up selling that bow three weeks later for $250 less than I paid for it. I took a bath on that, and my wife was not happy. Enter Black Widow Bows. They have a test drive program. If you're even remotely interested in shooting a Black Widow bow, give those guys at the shop a call. Talk to them. Tell them what you're looking for. They're going to give some really good guidance. They're going to have some really great advice. They're going to have a bow that's close to your specs on the demo rack, if not right on. You're going to run your card. You're going to pay for shipping both ways. You're going to pay for insurance both ways. And you're going to get to shoot the bow for a week. You might decide you don't want to shoot a Black Widow bow. And that's cool. Send it back. But you might decide you want to order one. You want to make some tweaks to get it just what you want. I wish I had that option eight years ago. If you're thinking about a Black Widow bow, give those guys a call. If nothing else, they're fun to talk to. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's episode of the Stickbow Chronicles, brought to you by Black Widow Bows. I'm Rob Petuto, and I got Blake Hunter going on down there. What's up, bud? What's up, man? Oh, not much. When this thing drops, we're we'll be, be knee deep in doodads. <laughs> <laughs> and for the untrained ear, that's uh, hunting odds. I cleared yeah. anything up there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Slang, southern slang. slang. Right on. Uh, Maybe a javelina or two, too. You know, uh, I'm all about shooting one of those things, but I just bought a jackrabbit call, and that would be mm-hmm. a hoot. That would be a hoot call them in, you know, like they come running right up to you. And... Yeah. I thought yeah, about I think uh, they got... I've watched some videos on YouTube, and uh, there's some pretty neat videos of people shooting them, calling them in. Anybody ever grab a hind leg or something? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> you like a sharp teeth, do they? Uh, yeah. Do they? Oh, yeah. Hmm. I wouldn't want, <laughs> I don't know if it'd kill you, but I wouldn't want one of them things chewing on my ankle. Hmm. Well, we might have to see if we can grab a hind leg. I'll video. <laughs> camera, camera will video. <laughs> hey, man, this week's episode, uh, this is off the wall, man. I had a blast personally. Yeah, I did too. It was uh, talking to Rick Rona, also who, known as uh, what's his name? What's his name on the field? Ricky Rowe. Ricky, Ricky Rowe. Rowe. <laughs> or what was the other one? Uh, Bull Durham. Uh, what did the uh, crash? Crash. <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> so I have to say real quick. Now I didn't say it last night uh, when we recorded the podcast. I was going to. I intended to. Um, and it just didn't fit it in and, and that's fine because I got to say how, um, I came, you know, how I came across Rick and, and we started to shoot, shoot in the breeze there. But, um, there's, you know, you, we're both, we both run the Instagram account. So you see how many messages just in Instagram we get just people, you know, just, Hey, how's it going? This type of stuff. Well, some Correct. of, some of those conversations turn into, you know, you know, a little deeper dialogue. Um, and, uh, so over the last few months, I don't know, three, four, five months, uh, Rick Rona, uh, we've shot the breeze a little bit, you know, bows and hunting and this and that. And, and, uh, when I shot that deer, the last day of the season, I took a quick, uh, picture of the blood trail in the snow and I posted on our Instagram story, bottom of the ninth. Well, Rick Rona comes back with this real, like, uh, a play call 
uh, baseball play call like that was not your average play call. So I messaged him back and said, hey, uh, Joe Buck couldn't have called a better play. And he says, what did he say? Uh, I played golf with Joe, or I've played golf a couple times with Joe. And I'm like, who in the heck are you? Turns out he's a yeah, turns out he's a major league retired major league uh, baseball catcher, and yep. uh, and I am a big fan of baseball. I've always been a huge fan of that position. So mm-hmm. man, I just like you got to be same kidding for me. me. Yeah, yeah, same for me. I played catcher all growing up. That's all I played. I never really played any other position. I played a little third base, but uh, mainly just caught my my whole childhood growing up all the way through high school traveled around and it was fun to fun to get to talk to him and uh got some pretty cool stories oh man so this one's baseball heavy <laughs> we we talk about uh we, we talk about uh um bow hunting a little bit uh he tells some really cool funny stories about the major league playing in the he major does. leagues yeah yeah he, good story good storyteller and um i mean we talk about uh how his competitive nature and stuff kind of plays into um, why and how he got started in a traditional archery. And, um, you know, and I, I can relate to that a lot because that's a lot of the same reasons and the, uh, that's the same fire that I've got lit into me is, is just the competitive nature with myself. Um, it just, it lights a fire. I mean, I think that's kind of uh, what kind of got him rolling in it too. Yeah, you know, I didn't mention uh well, you guys are talking catcher. I played I played quite a little bit of, of catcher when I was uh when I was a kid and uh some into high school. I'm pretty sure I set the standard on sock. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> well that that position and we talk about it on the podcast, but it that position just sucks in general unless you're just the type of person to enjoy getting hit in the chest with a fastball well see that's where i excelled is i did i played pretty good goaltender uh uh in in the adult league in hockey when i was uh uh, older so i like i didn't have to do all the technical aspects of catching i was Uh just uh you know a blocker oh yeah man that was a lot of rebounds part of (laughs) that was a part of uh my game growing up that i really and i probably should have focused more on the cooler aspects of being a catcher, but I really prided myself on being able to pick stuff out of the dirt and keep it in front of me. And, um, I wish we had hockey down here as much as y'all do up there. Uh, I feel like I've really, really, really would have enjoyed it. Oh yeah. Hockey's awesome. But I could watch, uh, highlight reels of catchers. I mean, I've always been a fan of the position. I grew up, I, that was, that was what was really funny is when I found out he was a catcher, I said, you're kidding me. I grew up idolizing Carlton Fisk who spent most of his uh, career with the Boston Red Sox. And he, he had, uh, uh, taken Carlton Fisk's position when Carlton had uh, was retired or let go or whatever with the White Sox, so it was just amazing. Mm-hmm. But anyways, getting back to it, what an uh, the amount of athleticism and and you know, serious. Just you got to be sharp. You got to be pretty pretty sharp to play that position. And watching those guys throw down uh, to second base, just, I could watch that all day long. That's just those guys. It's cannons. Yeah, it's phenomenal to watch a, a good catcher play is I mean well I mean that's the equivalent to a quarterback of the baseball team Mm -hmm. in my in my mind it's 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 a joy to watch somebody play that position really well because and I think part of it is is because they're involved in every uh every pitch is probably a lot of it but to watch somebody work back there that is just an exceptional athlete is a joy yeah no uh Jorge Posada as much as I hated the Yankees, watching him, watching uh, the Molinas, um, yeah, I just I really really enjoy the uh, athleticism and, and the speed. Yeah, it's just it's cool. Um, he did he did have some uh, some low lights. <laughs> he was talking about. <laughs> I busted up laughing when he said he picked off Kirby Puckett because I was like, man, I think I could have picked off Kirby Puckett. <laughs> it's the end yeah, of his that's career. Funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's well, good stuff. Yeah, it was uh, it was a lot of fun talking to him, and he, like I said, he's a he's a good storyteller. He keeps the conversation flowing, and it was a uh, it was a joy. Yep, yep. And uh, like you said, he he pulls a lot of that uh, 
competitiveness into his uh, learning how to shoot a stick bow. And, uh, yeah, he gets after it. He gets after it for sure. Yeah, it turns out he's not very far from me or one of the one of the places he hunts is probably only a couple hour drive from me. So, um, yeah, we're all going to have to get together and do something at some Abs- point. I've, I've got some places to hunt some pigs. He's got some places to hunt some pigs and we'll, uh, yeah, we got to make together and do something. We got to make that happen for sure. Um, so, you know, uh, yeah, I hope you guys like this. It's a little different. Um, storytelling, shooting the breeze. Uh, it was fun because, you know, as much as I like archery and bow, well, it's not archery. I like bow hunting. Um, that's right. Yeah. It was a nice break to just uh, shoot the breeze. Yeah. No, these are some of my favorite episodes, to be honest, is just no, no agenda, no schedule, no nothing. Um, (laughs) no pre thought out questions. Well, it was, it was, it it was funny. (laughs) I'm sorry for interrupting you, but it was funny last night where you're like, all of a sudden, you start start firing questions at him, like, "Hey, well, did did we start?" And you're like, "Yeah." <laughs> like, oh, okay. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just kind of got in the in the zone, I guess. Or thinking, "Hey, let's save this the for the trigger. podcast." Then pretty soon, you're like, hey, "Wait, wait a minute. We 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 doing this right now?" <laughs> That's good stuff. <laughs> oh, it was good. No, I uh, appreciate Rick coming on and and shooting the breeze with us. And um, yeah, I. I really enjoyed talking to him, and hopefully everybody enjoys it. If you're not a baseball fan, you might not be super uh, but even into if, parts of it. But even if you're not, it's some of the stories and how it relates into kind of uh, who he is and how he got into traditional archery now. It's it's a good good discussion. Well, man, some of the names he's dropping that he played with, and not just played with, but it's like buddies with. You know, that's pretty crazy. Uh, got Greg Maddox in the playoffs. Oh, no yep. joke. Pretty cool. Don pretty Zimmer. Pretty cool. Um, that yep. was a big name for me. And then Barry Bonds. He played what he played college ball at Barry Bonds and into the uh into and the bigs. Palmero. Oh, did was uh was it Barry Bonds that he had the big home plate home plate collision with? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Big stuff. That's pretty pretty cool, man. Ricky Rowe. That so so last week we got our, our first um uh uh code. SB Chronicles 10 for Backwoods Grind Coffee. And now we get to talk to a Major League Baseball player. We just need to retire. <laughs> we made it. You got a brushing We're with done. greatness here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's you, funny. You think that do you think this was a highlight of his career? He's like, he got I got on the stickbook chronicles. I would like to think so. Uh <laughs> <laughs> and plus he got to hunt with Cody Greenwood. So, you know, he's got a lot to choose from in his life there. Yeah. I would say that's probably a negative. <laughs> I I wish he was going on this hunt with us so that we could it just, we need a punching bag. We need a resident punching Man, bag. I don't know. You know, I, I think maybe Cody and I's relationship might be good for like a long distance relationship. I'm not so sure we'd get along like in person. <laughs> This is no, you can't just hang up on him or wait or walk away. And, and I'm sure he's thinking the same thing with me. I can't just like delete him off of Instagram. It's like, wow, you're way gayer in person than you were on the phone. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right, man. Oh, you, you got anything else? Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, I'm, I'm good if you are. Right on. Hey, uh, big thanks to the sponsors. Kafaru International, Selway Archery, The Footed Shaft, Backwoods Grind Coffee Company, and of course, Black Widow Bows. We appreciate everybody listening, all the support, and uh, yeah, a couple of knuckleheads, jaw jaw jacking, that's what you got here. (laughs) That's it. That's all I got. (laughs) Too much coffee. Keep hammering. Keep hammering. (laughs) All right, Roger out. I've got some extra stiffness in there i can only bend it to 90 degrees on my own when i really crank on it and that is no fun when the pt lady comes she gets it another five or eight degrees and i'm squirming like a biatch but uh it's got to be done so if i want to get back after the the hogs and the elk and all the golf and all the other coaching and crap i do i gotta i gotta stay on it you uh is your is your pt uh is her nurse is your pt nurse Named Gretchen or Ingrid or anything like that? She 
she is a delightful lady. She's built like an Ingrid, uh, built like a fire hydrant, but <laughs> her name is Angela and she's really sweet. And thank God I have her because she pushes me to the point of crying and, uh, and then lets up and whew, yeah, she's doing a good job. I mean, I, you got to have her. You got to have somebody like that that doesn't kill you, but damn near does or tries to. But anyway. Yeah, I've been doing some uh, exercises and stuff that that guy from uh, Mountain Physio gave me through uh, Instagram for my shoulder. And it's it's been painful, but it's really made a big, big difference. What's wrong with your shoulder from shooting or other, other injuries? No, nah, it was from work. Um I, I went to pick up a hose above my head and just kind of grabbed it with one hand. It's not anything really overly heavy. I, I've done a lot dumber stuff and just got it kind of back behind me or something, and it, it strained my rotator cuff is is what they think happened. Right. And yeah, it's it. it really – yeah, it really doesn't bother me day to day. It's just uh, when I shoot my bow mainly is the only time it bothers me, but it's gotten a lot better. I've ramped up my shooting in the last – you know, five, six days. And, uh, I think I'll be good to go for that. All that hunt. What'd you do to your knee? I, it's just wear and tear and abuse. I'm a bow legged guy and, uh, you know, been playing sports since I was tiny. Even when I retired from pro ball, I played men's basketball for 10 years for 45 and over or 30, whatever it was. And just ground and pound. And it just slowly wore out. I didn't have any surgery while playing ball for 14 years but the first week after I retired I knew I had to get a meniscus cleaned up so I had it done in in 98 then my right one done five years later then my left one done again in 2008 so from the last 12 years I just kind of been putting off the surgery because I just didn't want to have it done I want to take time off I don't want to miss hunting fishing golfing something and it wasn't and my doctor's like man you're an idiot I don't know how you're elk hunting and doing as hard as you go and this and that and he said, he'll talk to you one of these days, and you'll be calling me. So it, I got back from elk season and played a couple rounds of golf and walked 18 holes, which is, you know, five miles or so. And it was barking pretty good, and then it wouldn't go away. I did some remodeling around this room and house and doing floorboards and whatnot. It was barking at me, and I didn't—I don't even know what I did. It just started killing me. And I said, hey, Doc, get me on the schedule. He said, it's about time you call. God dang. So anyway, just uh, total knee replacement. It needs it. And uh, yeah, he straightened me out. I'm like six one again. It feels good to be tall again. I used to be six one, and I'm about six foot because my legs are no meniscus and bowed even further. And you know, nobody gets taller as they get older. But uh, when I get my right one done here in two three years, yeah, I'll be I'll be walking tall. Yeah, and you played you played catcher in the in the big leagues, didn't you? Yeah, I caught. Uh, a bunch. I mean, from little league through high school, through college. I mean, I played some other positions, but I think my dad knew at a young age I wasn't going to hit worth shit. So uh, he's we're going to make a catcher out of you. And he was uh, he played pro baseball, as did my older two brothers. And uh, I was the only one fortunate enough to get some breaks and get to the big leagues for any amount of time. But they both. Uh, my dad played double A for a handful of years. Both my brothers got up to triple A for five or six years, and just couldn't get that break but being a catcher uh you know you guy breaks a pinky or twist is it you know there's a lot more injuries so a lot better chance to get called up and when I called up with the Cubs that was fun it was an injury got a break and when I got called up it did well and uh, uh had some good times and then the last 10 years of my career I bounced around in AAA in the big leagues and you get a week here and a month here and a couple months here and eight days here and after that I was 34 years old in 1998 and Got called up to the Rangers for a minute. Pudge Rodriguez got hurt, and uh, I didn't even get in. I just held a backup player, a backup catcher for him, never played. So they just called somebody up for emergency. So eight days later, he was feeling good. They sent me down, and a month or so later, the season was over, and I retired and started being a full-time dad and had two boys and started coaching the T-ball and Little League and football and whatever and hunting and fishing and being a full-time dad. And It's been a good ride ever since. Well, do you do you catch any uh, hey, any catches I, from any big names or hey, any big games or anything like that? Hey, can I jump yeah. in here for a second? Yeah. Uh, are we starting, Blake? Sure. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm thinking. Hey, this is all good stuff, man. Um, 
let's let's get this podcast rolling. All right, you're recording. Record, but... <laughs> we're recording. We're 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 super official and and professional here. Oh, I know. I've been following for months. <laughs> <laughs> you know what kind of circus this is. <laughs> Yeah, my a couple of buddies like Rona, you ought to get a podcast, talk about all your minor league bullshit stories and crap. I'm like, that's fun to like me and a handful of guys that live that nightmare, but I don't know how many other people and, and most of the stuff you can't say it how it truly happened and why you did it and how it worked out. I mean, it, uh, some of the tricks and stunts I pulled on in AAA on the airlines, whew, I'd go to prison doing that crap now. But it it was fun back in you know 1989, 1990, back in the day. So, TSA. <laughs> so I, I, sorry I, that I derailed uh, Blake's question. Have you what what big name um, pitchers have you caught? Well, when I got called up to the big leagues with the Cubs, got drafted by the Cubs, played three years in the minor leagues, get called up uh, with those guys at the end of the '88 season when they have the expanded roster. I got called up, so I'm a 25, maybe a. 24 and a half, 25 year old rookie skinny catcher. I get called up the Cubs. They weren't that very good. Don Zimmer's my manager. Uh, the big man on the pitching staff was Rick Sutcliffe yeah. and uh, another multi Cy Young Award winner, Greg Maddox, was on the team. And uh, as big as those guys were, I came in late in a game uh, and caught Goose Gossage. <laughs> and, you know, he's an elk hunting fool and he, uh, man, they messed with me hard. When you're a rookie, especially, you know, I'm just looking at these guys and I finally got the big leagues. You know, I know it, I may never get back again, but I enjoyed every minute of it. But when Goose Gossage is sitting in the bullpen talking about elk hunting with you, you know, it was freaking <laughs> – my mouth was drooling. So, and then the only reason why he was doing it, because at the same time he's telling me some bullshit story about him inviting me to come elk hunting at his ranch. This guy was putting <laughs> shaving cream up on my – piled up on my hat and I'm like, oh yeah okay yeah he goes, and then hey Rona, we need a bullpen catcher so I run down to the bull we were in the bench there but I run down the bullpen shaving cream falling everywhere you know 8,000 fans right there two feet from me laughing their ass off and I'm a rookie man I fell for that one hook line and crawled at but man it was a good time oh that's funny did you so you don't have go ahead Rob. Did, did you grow up um where, where what state did you grow up in yeah, I still live uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I grew up. My dad played uh, and retired. He's from uh, just outside of Chicago, he and my mom both. But when they moved to Tulsa when my dad was playing in the minor leagues. And then in the off season, he became an uh, electrician journeyman, and he lived free, room and board, at the National Guard Armory, which was adjacent to the minor league ballpark. And so the three or four, his last three years there, and like the next five or six years, after he retired, they lived there. My three older siblings, uh, two sisters and a brother were both born there, and he was an electrician. So he retired, became a electrician, and just lived in Tulsa and raised a family. And he was, a, you know, a, a known minor leaguer there. And back in that day, even though it was a minor leagues, he was kind of a big man in town because he, he played so many years there, which is rare. You don't typically play year after year in the same town, but in that era, he did. So uh, he had baseball camps and schools and clinics uh, every summer and was an electrician uh, and uh, raised us six kids and put us through Catholic high school and everybody went to college and got a degree except me and I'm the baby because I was chasing the, the curveball and trying to hit it. I could have got back. I came real close, but by the time I retired and came back and was a dad, somebody offered me a sales job and it, it's going to pay the bills. So I, I didn't go back to school, but, and it hadn't cost me yet, but, uh, Anyway, it's been it's been fun. Well, I was just curious, and you grew up hunting. Um, you know, if, if Goose is talking about elk hunting, had you been? You, were you an elk hunter at that time, or no, was... not at all. I grew up just uh, fa- uh, pond hopping and fishing, uh, just fishing. Matter of fact, they had a neighbor up the street that was a member at a country club, and on Mondays it was closed. A real nice country club here in Tulsa, and they had those manicured pond, and we could drive the old station wagon way back in there, and and fish a couple holes, and, man, we caught a lot of big bass. We, we didn't keep them because you'd probably grow a third ear if you ate them with all the chemicals in the pond, but it was fun to catch them. And my older brother came with me, but he was a little bored. If they're not jumping on his hook, so he would wade and find golf balls, and my dad and I would fish. And some days, I get a little older, like 10 or 11, they'd drop me off, leave me there all day, and pick me up before dark back in that day. It was fun. But I didn't get into hunting 
uh, until I went to college, Wichita State, got into dove hunting. And then uh, later in the fall, got did a little pheasant hunting and had some great trips there. Then got into duck hunting. And, man, I was ate up with duck hunting uh, in the, the late 80s. And then I went back. I got to the big leagues in 88, had a, not much, but a little bit of money in my pocket. And I go back to Wichita State for the alumni uh, golf tournament. And some guy came in, one of my ex-team, hey, man, anybody want to buy a bow? I got this bow. And, and he goes, but it's left-handed. And I said, well, I shoot left-handed. Now, I shot a little BB gun, shotgun, whatever I shot, I shot left-handed because I'm so left-eye dominant. I did that when I was – started that when I was like a Cub Scout or something. My, my Cub Master fixed me on that deal. But anyway, I said, I, you know, dude, I got 100 bucks. That's all I'll give you. He goes, that's all I need. And it was some old garbage bow. But, I mean, it – it shot and I was just amazed when I took it out in the backyard or in the driveway, I could hit a quarter at 10 yards. And then I backed up to 15 yards, which felt like, God, that's a bomb. And then 20 yards and I could hit a baseball or tennis ball. And, and I never shot I passed 20 yards. I didn't even think about it, but so I got started with that. And then uh, got back to the big leagues and meeting certain guys and certain opportunities. I started getting some free equipment. So I, I've been a, a Hoyt guy ever since I got a couple free Hoyts early on from Jim Eisenreich with the Phillies or Will Clark with the Rangers. Uh, they hooked me up because I was, you know, there's not a lot of rednecks on the team, but there's always a handful. And it's a great sport when you're a professional baseball player. You come home, you know, if you're not in the playoffs, you know, you're home October 1. Boom. Now, get after Get out in the woods. And now, you just said. Anyway, the first time I went in the woods with that bow, October 11th, 1989, 11 a.m., I'll never forget it. I've, sh- I've practiced shot, but I didn't know what to deer hunt. I didn't even read a magazine. I just And deer were walking at me from every angle. I'm like, this is crazy. I'm just out for a stroll in the park just to, I don't know, in a couple hundred acres where my in-laws have a lake house, and deer were walking, and I'd stand still, and they'd get closer and closer, and they'd look at me and stomp and do whatever they do. And I was like, that's weird. That's cool. They don't see me. They see me, but, anyway, but I couldn't get drawn for heck, as you know, and so finally, I, I went to the third little part later that afternoon, and I heard some. Ch- 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 ch. I said, "I'm not waiting. I'm drawing." And two little forkers came by, and I shot at one. I don't know if I was under him, over him. I don't know, but I never found the arrow. I think it went over him and skipped in the leaves. But I crawled around and looked. But man, I was hooked like <laughs> none other. And I hunted the next three or four years, and you might see one deer every three or four trips back then because baiting was not legal in Oklahoma back then. But anyway, I shot my first year, uh, October the next year, 89 and uh, a nice eight point came underneath my stand and it was straight underneath me and I drew and I had this crappy old release. I'm, it had so much play and I said, man, if I miss this at one yard, I'll never live this down. So I'm squeezing, 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 dude, it bolted, you know, it sensed me and I didn't get it. So anyway, I said, I'm at 30 more minutes. I'm going to give it, I'm going to the house and a spike came by and I nailed it. And I was like, this is a great, I've had some great moments. Like you guys asked me about big games. I caught Greg Maddox in game one of the 1989 national league playoffs. That was a thrill. Cause I've got Ernie Banks behind me and a hall of famer, Billy Williams and Ron Santo. And these guys have played decades for the Cubs, never played one single playoff game for the Cubs in their life because the vision was so deep and they, you know, then by the time I get there, it's broken up to five teams. It's a little easier to get in the playoffs, even easier now. But you, know, you enjoy this, young man. We played our life here and never sniffed a playoff game. And here you roll out of the boat from Oklahoma and you're freaking catching Greg Maddox and game stinking one of the playoffs. Man, I floated floated out on the field. But I come home and, and, and couldn't wait to deer hunt and duck hunt. But now the, the thrill for me is the deer hunt. And now, of course, the last five years – I'm a trad guy living the trad life. And now I, this last year, I'm at 100% committed to it before I was a little scared, but I shot it and tinkered with it, but I'm on the board a handful of times now. And it's, 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 it's something else, man. I'll never go back. Well, do you think that you enjoy it so much just because of that competitive nature in you, uh, just from playing sports your whole life and being in a competitive atmosphere, just that gives you gives you something to almost be competitive with yourself. Exactly. You have to work so stinking hard. I'm lucky I've got good neighbors. I've got a backyard I can shoot. I'm in town, but I don't know if it's legal, but I shoot, you know, out to fences 40 yards. So I can shoot about 38, 39 yards. And, 
and do it safely when the neighbors aren't playing basketball or walking the dog or whatever. But uh, uh, I, I just doing shooting, you know, for 30 years with the compound, I'm not saying it's easy and it's a lock, but when you've got corn out there and you're a good spot and, and you've been baiting them in for years and, you know, you got does coming in and you can shoot a doe anytime or, or just a matter of time waiting for a decent buck or, you know, wait every other two, three, four years to get a really nice buck. By the time they get in 20, 30 yard, 30 yard, I'm not saying it's a slam dunk, but it, it almost should be with modern equipment. You know, you, you, you'd mentioned that you, uh, you know, playing in the big leagues, you caught for some, some, you know, hall of fame pitchers. Um, but you also had the opportunity to, to hunt with Cody Greenwood. So, I mean, that's, that's gotta be a big part of your, your life story there. <laughs> It is. Now, I've had more fun with that guy. I mean, my kids talked me into getting on Instagram probably, uh, de- I don't know, let's say early 2018. Because I'm, I've never did Facebook, so I'm not putting pictures of my, of my uh, you know, Little League pictures. Or occasionally I'll put a picture of my dog doing something cool. But mostly hunting or fishing or, you know, I'm knee deep in a pond trying to hit a golf ball. Or just stupid, silly stuff. Dad, you do some cool stuff. Put, get on Instagram. I'm like, okay, what do I do? Sign me up. So, uh, you know, once a month I put something on. Shoot, now it's about once a week. I'll do it every other day. I'm posting something. That I try to hope it's amusing. Sometimes it's amusing. Sometimes it's just, uh, you know, my dog, my old lab, you know, catching the Frisbee in slow motion, something like that. But typically it's some something's dying or I'm be shooting at something or doing something I probably shouldn't be and try to be halfway entertaining. But anyway, I reach out to – Cody, because I'm trying to learn a lot about this uh, uh, trad stuff. Uh, so two years ago, I, I bought a used Black Widow from some guy in New Jersey, and it is absolutely gorgeous. And a friend in Missouri, I sell stainless steel, so I get up to Springfield, and Nick's in Missouri, the Black Widow guys are just, so I would go there once a month, once a month. Never bought anything. I might have bought a finger tab in about five years, but Anyway, so they kind of got to know, oh, here's this guy again, you know, all kicking tires and whatnot. Old, I shot old tight it. Rona. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I just didn't want to drop $1,300 on something I may suck at because I'm one of these guys. I'll do it, but I want to be good and competitive, and I don't want to wound stuff. And and I've learned that wounding as bad as – I don't mind missing, but wounding does suck. I wounded one this year, and that's brutal, but uh, it's part of the game. But I stuck a couple too. But anyway. I got on this Black Widow kick. Well, I didn't know the Black Widow that this buddy of mine said, oh, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. Jump on it. If it was right-handed, it'd be way more expensive. It's left-handed. He ship it to you for $650. It's a, a PSRX. So I didn't know what that meant. That's exotic and this and that. It's got the laser. It's beautiful. But it is fun to look at when you're not shooting anything. But So I dedicated the last two years to shoot this sucker. But, man, is it finicky. Your wrist and this and that and because it's a 60 inch, you know, 50 style recurve, which, so it has a longbow style handle, which is not forgiving. So I started hitting Cody up and I don't say bugging him. I probably was, but I just once a week, Hey man, what do you, what about this? And, and started listening to the trad lab stuff and the push guys and Tom Clum and I'm getting into it. I'm YouTube and I'm podcasting it. I just don't want to suck. I want to kill something with it, but I don't, I just hate doing something if I'm going to suck. And if I'm going to suck, I'll suck for a while, but I'll figure it out. Just like golf or baseball. I sucked at that for a long time. Never did figure that out. But anyway, but the deer hunting, <laughs> it, there's nothing like a big buck strolling down there. And even a, even a, even a doe when, you know, you can see them all the time, but when you're coming in and you know, okay, guess what? It's getting dark. No bucks around. I'm going to drill her. Then the heart pumps and it's not stinking easy. Now, I don't care what the, a recurve especially, but not even a compound. But So I wanted that extra. I've killed enough stuff with the compound. I wanted that extra challenge, and that's why I jumped on that recurve. took me two years to kind of figure it out. I'm getting there. But I started hitting Cody up. He started talking about coming through Oklahoma and living in a travel trailer, and I thought he lived in Kansas City. But I said, hey, man, I'm going hunting this weekend. I'll, I'll get you covered up. You're trying to shoot 20 animals and 2020 i'll get you five tonight if you can shoot worth the crap and anyway so damn if he didn't yeah let's go let's go i'll meet you quick trip and uh we drove down there and uh and then uh took him hog hunting to another buddy's place in southern oklahoma we hunted that place for three days and three nights that was 
I, I got stories for that deal. That'd take a whole nother podcast, but we had a ball and uh, he, uh, he's got a big vocabulary. He dropped some words I've never heard before. And I thought my wife has done that enough, but he was talking about when you purchase the string, I'm like, or perch. I don't know what he's something about. I just, you mean when you grab a hold of it? And anyway, <laughs> he, he's, he, he helped me a lot. We talked about some stuff and I, I taught him a few things about this part of town, especially my secret weapon. And the, which is that nose jammer I was teasing him about, and he didn't believe me. And sure enough, I here just spray some on your boots, walk in the woods, and see what happens. Sure enough, he had five or six deer cross his trail, and he just knew he was busted. And they stopped, smelt, and they came right in. He had thirteen deer in front of him. He never did get a shot off. <laughs> of course, he was he was in the ground. Uh, he got out, got out of the tree stand because it wasn't it didn't fit him just right. It was my son's, who's a little bit smaller guy than big Cody, but, uh, so he got downwind and he got covered up and had a hell of a time. But so I turned him on to some little nose jammer action. Yeah. I've not ever used the nose jammer specifically, but, uh, it's certainly something I'm willing to try. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but you, you need to try it. I'm just telling you it. I thought it was a hemp gimmick and a hoax and this and that. And, not going to turn this into a nose jammer commercial, but you know, sometimes you can do everything right and nothing's going to work. And then sometimes you can go in there after work smelling like gasoline and, and a freaking chili dog and the biggest buck in the world. I mean, there's luck involved, but I've had a lot of experience and you can do it with a vanilla extract. When I first started hunting with some old timers, we were using anise oil or, you know, it smells like black liquor. It's just some type of cover scent that is also an attractant. And I went elk hunting this year uh, at breakfast. We ran into old timer. He's an outfitter, not an outfitter. He's a, uh, he'll, he'll get your deer off the mountain and elk off the mountain with his pack horses. But he said, you didn't hear it from me, but you get some vanilla extract and get on a little rub line down there. And those bulls will walk right in. So it, it, it just smells good. And I think that's illegal in Colorado. So he told me don't do it, but, and I didn't hear it from him, but, I did. I think no jammers legal, so I'll try that next year. But uh, it works. It helps. But it still, when you're 20 yards and you got a corn feeder in front of you, that that's kind of helpful too. But getting in and out helps. For sure. Yeah, Cody. Uh, I think Cody just pretends like he knows what uh, the words that he's saying mean. <laughs> you're yeah, muted, he's got, Rob. He's got a few projects going on. No, when he said purchase, I'd have looked at him and said, man, I got to buy it again. I already got one. I don't need two. <laughs> was it, was it per, per, no, it wasn't purse, purse, when you purse the string. Maybe that's what it was. Wow. Whatever it was. was. Heard of it. I mean, wow. Yeah, he'd have lost I, me there. Then I got to thinking that's why, you know, the, the handbag your wife holds <laughs> is called a purse because you hold it in that particular banner. Made sense to me, but never heard it used that way. But, all right. Strange cat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm going to back way up. So you mentioned that you got a, a a free bow from Will Clark, right? Well, he he gave me a lady's number. I said it was Hoyt. Actually, it was a Golden Eagle at the time. Okay. And since that bow got stolen, I've gotten I've been a Hoyt guy ever since. But I'm going to yeah. I'm, I'm going to connect some dots here. Then, uh, were you not catching a game, a uh, playoff game? And Will Clark uh, was at bat and hit a home run with bases loaded. Yeah, that was that was in that game one of the playoffs, the nineteen eighty nine playoffs. Yeah, that was a pretty significant. I mean, ass am, am I connecting some I dots here, Blake? Are you with me? Yeah. <laughs> you 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 following me? Yep. <laughs> I thought Zimmer was going to come out to the mound and take Maddox out because. Shoot, I think we were losing like six to three, and it was in the fifth inning. It's about time he wasn't having a good day. And uh, he came out to the mound and said, Okay, what, what, what are you going to throw? Him? What are we going to throw? Him? You know how pitchers and catchers cover their face and their mask and do all that stuff now because the camera's in there and you're afraid somebody's going to read your lips and cheat and relay it. And, but Greg Maddox was just looking towards home plate. I'm standing there. So, yeah, I'm going to throw him a throw him fastball inside and change ups. Let's go. Let's get him. So I run back. And I put down a change up, and he shook me off, and uh, I put down another sign, and uh, he threw a fastball inside that kind of sank over the middle, and that Will Clark hit that ball so damn far, it still hadn't come down. But 
the next year spring training, we find out that, uh, that he read Greg Maddox's lips. And so it was a big buzz. And, uh, reporters were coming to ask me about it. I'm like, I, I know the mound visit you're talking about, but I don't, I never heard that story. Is that true? He goes, that's what he's saying. So from about that time on, that's these pitchers have been covering their mask and covering their face and whispering and sign language and talking in code, et cetera. Cause they don't want to get outwitted by the hitter on the on deck circle. <laughs> yeah. I'm, there's a whole lot of that stealing signs and everything else that goes on too. I'm sure. Banging trash cans and whatnot. Oh Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that was the latest scandal, wasn't it? Well, I watched since I've been on the couch a lot watching YouTube and in between hunting videos and uh, and, and Dale Brisby videos, <laughs> I uh, watched some baseball videos talking about the all the pitchers that are cheating. You know, when I was playing, they 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 most everybody, not everybody, forty percent of the guys were on steroids. I wouldn't have believed that that was high because not everybody looked like it, but and I didn't. But uh, there's a lot of guys that were. But the pitchers nowadays are getting their spin rate up and. So they're using some really sticky, tacky substances, and they're almost all doing it. And so uh, they don't complain. Rarely do they complain about the opposing pitcher because the whole pitching staff on your team is doing it too. So that's why there's not a lot of commotion. But just this last year, and uh, there's been a lot of controversy about using some ultra sticky to get your spin rate up, which makes the fastball have that rising appearance more. And of course, your breaking ball break a lot more. And these big guys are trying to crush home runs and they're swinging for the fences, so you can miss a bat or two. You can get a lot of punch outs and have a good game. But the old when I was playing, it was steroids were legal. There, you know, there wasn't a rule against it. Uh, pint this and that. The old saying was, you've heard it before. If you're not cheating, you ain't trying. And that's just everybody lived by that. Now there were a few no nos, like if you're blatantly relaying a sign from second base by, you know, you just got to change your sign. When that kid comes up next time, maybe you drill him in the ribs, but. There were some bean balls here and there, but mostly it was it was everybody's looking for a competitive edge and try to win a ball game. You, did you ever catch a knuckleball pitcher? Oh my God, that was the other one I, video I watched the other night. Yes, and it was funny about this kid grew up here in Tulsa, and he and I played little league together. His name is Steve Sparks, and he was uh, like a couple of the, the most recent you know knuckleball pitchers. They were typically normal, everyday pitchers, fastball, curveball, sliders, change-up guys, but their stuff just didn't work well. And they were below average, but they were great guys, great teammates, the organization loved them, but they knew they farted around with a knuckleball. So they'd say, hey, this particular kid, hey, Steve, we're going to release you. You're never going to get out of double A. But if you want to tinker with that knuckleball, we'd love to experiment with that because you got Charlie Huff and Phil Necro and R.A. Dickey and, of course, uh, the kid for Boston, the Tim pitched till he's forty-five. Tim uh, was Tim was in it. Tim Tim Wakefield, yeah. Tim Wakefield, yep. yeah. That TV show, yeah. He pitched nineteen years and finally got his two hundredth win. But normally they're a, a long relief guy. Anyway, it is so exhausting. The best game <laughs> in my life I ever caught. I swear, and uh, I caught a ten inning game. This is my buddy Steve. He threw a ten inning. We won one to nothing, so he threw one hit, shut out, and I was exhausted. I only dropped one ball the whole game, and it's just it's just exhausting. You don't, you're not up there giving a stance and giving a target like you would for a normal pitcher. You're 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 squatting, and you just have this big. I don't. It's not like a, a girl's softball catcher's mitt, a big basket, and you just sit there and you you wait and just wait, 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 and just try to snatch it right before it hits you in the cup. I mean, that's all you can do last second. Because if you try to reach out there and catch it, it'll hit you in the face about every time. So it was fun. It was exa- he had a nice uh, two, three years in the big leagues. He never was going to get the big leagues. and uh, But he pitched – he may even pitch longer than that. And then he was a color commentator for the Houston Astros uh, not too long ago. I'm not sure what he's doing now. But Steve Sparks, yeah, Tulsa kid. Well, you know, when Wakefield was in his prime and, and Boston was making those runs of the championship, the pennant and stuff – um, they had, I can't remember the catcher, but they had a catcher specifically catching for him. Um, That's typically the case. They yeah. had several. Yeah. Be- and that the reason why typically the other, every team has, you know, two catchers, rarely three, but occasionally two and normal guy will catch five days a week. And the other guy will catch, you know, two games a week, maybe. Or if you have a five man rotation, that starter will catch four and you're the designated knuckleball guy. 
And I guarantee I would rather catch four days in a row and have one day off than catch a knuckleballer is you need about a week to recover. Because once you catch him that game, then two days later, you got to go down the bullpen and catch him again for his bullpen session. And it's a nightmare because he's working on stuff. You get your beat to hell. It's like, <laughs> hey, coach, do you mind if I play a game tonight so I can get a day off? This bullpen and knuckleball sessions, it's wearing me out. But that's the way it was. Uh, I was with the Brewers in 94 in, uh, in AAA. And Mike Matheny, longtime St. Louis Cardinals catcher, was the uh, our starting catcher in AAA. He had a great major league career and a major league manager for the Cardinals as well. But Mike was the the first round draft pick and a great young man. And so they signed me to help him and get him along. And so he caught four guys and then I caught the knuckleball. And he, oh my God, I'm still having nightmares about that. But it was fun. It, it was it was something else. There's not a whole lot cooler to watch on TV than when a knuckleballer's having a good night. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's pretty crazy. It's hysterical. I'll never forget. You know, umpires have a hard time, you know, calling those pitches at time, and hitters are baffled by it, when, especially when the wind is blowing out so that the knuckleball pitcher's pitching into a slight wind so the, the, the ball is dancing even more. So if the wind is blowing at the pitcher's back, you know, at 20 miles an hour, and he's only throwing at 60 or 70, it's not dancing as much, and – they usually get rocked, but at least the wind's blowing in, so the ball stays in the ballpark, hopefully. But when the wind's blowing out, all the hitters are excited. Oh, man, I'm going to hit a couple home runs. This guy's lobbing this weak sauce in here. And then they just look like fools. I had a pitch knuckleball come in, and it came in top of the zone. And this guy swung but checked his swing because the ball was coming in high. But by the time it got to me, which is four feet, I picked it out of dirt. And he's like, Strike three and, a, and, a, and a, what, that, the pitch is high. What are you talking? Well, the pitch is high. It's, well, I don't know, but it wasn't a strike. He didn't know if it was high, low. He just know it came across belt high, belly button high, and I picked it out of the dirt. And umpire had to ring it up because somewhere it had to cross the plate. And I tagged him and threw it around. And he got thrown out of the game. But I asked the umpire, I said, "Dude, that was unreal." I mean, when they say a ball falls off the table, that literally, if you roll a ball in slow motion, it just literally fell off the table and, and went in the dirt. And uh, it's you know of course some of them hit you some of them go to, a lot of them go to the screen and that's why a lot of big league teams don't like to mess with them because you can steal bases off those guys they have a tendency to have a lot of wild pitches they have a tendency man, they may not give up many hits but if one fat ball comes in the middle and doesn't break then boom there goes a three run home run and you're down you know four to nothing or whatever so but when Wakefield was on and he's unhittable it's amazing and he you can pitch till you're 50 years old and he damn near did it. Yeah, those guys have really, really long careers, the guys who do it and do it well. And I guess it's just because of that. Uh, I'm assuming it's less wear and tear on that on that shoulder. Well, all these guys are coming up to get the big leagues now. I used to, if you threw 90 and you could control and had good, you have a chance to get the big leagues. Now, nobody's throwing 90 in the big leagues unless you're like, you know, 40 years old. Everybody's throwing 94, 95, 96, 98, 102, 106. Now, a lot of that has to do with the technology of the radar gun. The radar guns pick the ball up the split second that lives your finger versus like when Nolan Ryan used to throw 98 miles an hour, that the last reading it got before it hit the catcher's mitt, it was going 98. So I, I heard a scientific study where Nolan Ryan probably still threw the hardest pitch of all time, about 107 or 108 back in his prime. But it doesn't matter. If you throw 100 miles an hour and it's straight, those guys still hit it. But if you can throw 62 miles an hour with some little wiggly knuckleball, they don't train for it. They don't gear up for it. They hate it. They don't want to practice. A lot of guys want a day off because if you go 0 for 5 off a knuckleballer, it'll put you in a slump for two weeks. Oh, I you know, never thought about next that. Next night, you face a guy or you're facing a guy in a bullpen that's throwing 98. So you got you face a guy throwing 62 to 75, knuckleballer. It's a nightmare, and then you've got to face some guy coming out of the bullpen throwing a hundred. It's just it's a long day and a long week. We're, we're, did did the batters have any sense of humor when they're coming up there uh, on a That's knuckleballer? A lot of a lot of them did, and uh, you know most of my playing time was in AAA. So when I got the big leagues, except for my rookie year, first couple of years, why I, I I was a platoon catcher with Joe Girardi. Uh, we were both rookie catchers at '89 season. Anyway. Most of my catching when I played every day or, you know, three, four times a week was in, was in AAA. And uh, 
those other guys in AAA, it's different. You're not in the big leagues. You're not. I mean, you're working hard and you're grinding because you're trying to make a living. But at the same time, there's not fifty thousand fans. There's might be five thousand fans, and on a Wednesday night, there may be you know, 128 fans, and that's just because they're giving away something free at the door. So it's a little more laid back, and you can cut up and goof off a little bit more. But you got to know certain hitters were really hard asses and were really grinding out, and they're batting 332, and they're trying to lead the league in hitting, and they're trying to get to the big leagues or maybe get back to the big leagues. And uh, if I knew them and knew that they were hard ass and they were focused, I wouldn't mess with them. But every once in a while, there was a guy that he was just a, you know, he was a prick because he was a bad teammate. His own teammates didn't like him, and we didn't like Alex him. Rodriguez. He, was, he was just one of those guys you didn't care for. I would mess with him pretty hard. I would do the old throw dirt on it, you know, like a third grader, throw dirt on his shoe, and <laughs> then spit tobacco <laughs> on his sh- shoe, and then throw dirt on it, which they really hate, and almost to where they want to fight. And my whole job was, hey, man, if I'm not getting any hits, I don't want you to get any hits either. And then, uh, then there'd be some guys, Hey, Rona, what's up, man? Hey man, what are you doing? Oh man, there's ladies night tonight. And we're in Nashville. There's a big bar just opened up. We're going to go drink free. Oh, that's awesome. Whack. He hit a double. And next time, Hey man, so you, we, we, let's go, let's take a cab there. I'll pick up whack another double. Well, you learn certain guys that you talk to, you loosen them up, you take their mind off the pitcher and what's at stake. And they're loosey goosey and they're just hitting piss missiles all over the yard. So the next time that guy comes up, I'm not saying crap to that guy. I'm not, I'm not saying crap, but I did have, uh, cause I was in the same league for about 10 years and pretty much stuck at AAA. So I saw a lot of big leaguers up and down and down and up and young guys. So, uh, I had a reputation from being that a-hole catcher. That was a little obnoxious behind the play, trying to get in your head, trying to frustrate you because if I'm hitting 220, I'm telling you, I'm frustrated. So I don't want you hitting lasers all over the yard. And then when I did get on, I tried to pick them off and, they didn't like that either because they had to move and run and dive and get dirty. So I was a pain in the ass. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> I'll let you go. I'll let you go, Blake. I got a million questions. No, it's it's funny. I played catcher for. I never played college or anything like that, but I played catcher for thirteen years growing up and uh, traveled around a little bit in high school. And man, I I wouldn't play. I wouldn't want to go back and play any other position. I just loved it. And there was times that I hated it, but I mean, it's, I, it's just the game is, it's, it's always moving back there. It's all, you've always got something going on. Yeah. That's when I, I was never officially diagnosed as AD, having ADD, although I had a, a two and a half hour shooting lesson with Tom Clum senior <laughs> uh, on a ski trip. I stopped by there and scheduled a lesson and about an hour and a half into it. He looked at me, and goes, Dude, you're ADD. <laughs> I looked at my son. He looked at me. Uh, we had a good chuckle. He's probably right. I don't know. But uh, I was the youngest of six kids, so I'm the baby. And I had ants in my pants. And I had a lot of energy at school. Probably definitely hyperactive. But so, And I wasn't a great fielder. I was okay. But I just had a lot of energy and a good arm. And my dad put me behind the plate. He didn't coach me a lot. He was coaching my older brothers. But he just worked with me in catching. And I had to be – the center of attention. I was the point guard. I was the quarterback. I had to be the catcher. I need to be in the action. And I just loved it. And to be a good catcher, not only do you got to love that part of it, you got to love the suck part of it. The block and the balls, the dirt, the dust, the heat, the pain, the foul tips. Uh, You don't get as, as you know, being a high school catcher, you don't get the extra batting practice. You barely get any batting practice at all. And they wonder why you hit 230 your whole life. Everybody else has hit 12 times more than I have. I'm down there getting curveballs off my cup all day long with these JV dicks. And I, I need, it should be taking BP with varsity, but I'm not. So yeah, but I'm not complaining. You know, my dad told me it's the quickest way to the big leagues. And I always had a goal of getting the big leagues. Looking back, it was probably terribly foolish for me to think that, but that's the goal I had. I wanted to play division one baseball. I want to play, play uh, pro and get the big leagues. And it happened. And looking back, it's so silly though. You know, a lot of times you hear the guys say, the older I am, the, the better I was. The older I get, the more I realize, man, I was not that good. I got some breaks, and my dad was better than me. Both my older brothers were better athletes. One was a middle infielder. One was a pitcher. My dad was a catcher, but I, I'm just I'm glad he pushed me in that direction, and I ate it up and had a passion for it. I was a, a you got to be a dirt bag. You got to be a dog back there and get dirty and. My, the best part back in the day when I played, you could block home plate. I mean, you could block it 
big time. And one of the best plays I ever did, I, I played semi-pro, not semi-pro, what do you call it, college ball uh, with Barry Bonds. Here's my outfield. Barry Bonds, Rafael Palmero, Shut and Pete Incubilia. Shut Those up. Are my, <laughs> you're the 1984 Hutchinson Broncos in Hutchinson, Kansas. So I went to Wichita State, and they had me come out there for the summer. We had the best best college team ever. We almost beat the Olympic team that had Mark McGuire and Will Clark on them. We had them down 6-2, to two, and then we made a couple changes, and they snuck back and beat us. We played them just one exhibition game, but we had a better team than them. But anyway, uh, I knew Barry Bonds very well, super athlete. Rafael Pimero. Super unbelievable. P. Incovid, these guys were hitting two and three home runs a game with the aluminum bat. I mean, they were men among boys. And uh, one of the last games of the season, I hit a grand slam in the bottom of the eighth. I'm batting about sixth. So three, four, five hole hitters were on base. So Bonds, Incovidia, and Palmero were on base. I hit a grand slam, bottom of the eighth, put us ahead. We win the game. The next day, the pitcher in the paper, guess who was in it? Bonds, Palmero. <laughs> <laughs> and in Cavillia standing at the home plate high five and I'm jogging around second you know so anyway. <laughs> just part of being a catcher, man. you gotta be a dog you just gotta enjoy the sup <laughs> oh so I got to know Barry Bonds who was an incredible athlete back when he was skinny and fast he could bond or he home run but his home runs didn't go in the ocean like they did you know a couple of years ago they were they'd go over the fence a screaming meme and he had plenty of and he wouldn't have hit 700 home runs but he Damn sure would have hit 500 home runs if, you know, allegedly he didn't take per- performing enhancing junk. But anyway, he was round second one time. I was at Wrigley Field my rookie year, and I knew he was he wasn't the kind of guy that was just going to rip my head off like uh, a Ken Caminetti, just a wild man. So, and Wrigley Field grass is real thick. So my best buddy on the team, Doug Desenzo in center field, comes screaming in on a single, scoops it up, throws it. And for a center fielder to throw somebody out at home plate, it's tough. they got to charge hard. It's got to be hard. You can do it on acid turf, but thick grass, it's really hard. So he barely cleans the mound, clears the mound, and this ball is like trickling to me. And so I'm squatting on home plate, just covering it up, both knees down. And I know Bonds is not going to tear me up. And if he does, I can lean back. I'm real flexible. But he's just going to slide in hard, and, and I'm going to find the ball and tag him out. And sure enough, I did he hit me, his cleat hit my knee pad, his knee folded up, smoked his knee on my knee pad. He folded over, uh, writhing in pain, and I, the ball was laying there. So I picked it up and dove on him, like rung him up, and it was the third out. And I did like Pete Rose did when he ended the inning. Remember, he used to slam it on the AstroTurf, and I ran back to the dugout. Well, I slammed it not towards the mound, but right next to his ear hole of his helmet. I mean, oh. I almost hit him in the face. And Sports Center that night opened up sports center with me spiking that ball next to his head in fast and fast reverse like like I was dribbling a basketball <laughs> dribbling a baseball by his head oh I was so embarrassed <laughs> my coach roasted me the next day but at batting practice the next day every player for the Pittsburgh Pirates came up to me and thought that was the greatest thing they'd ever seen because they were not Barry Bonds fans <laughs> oh man that's funny uh, this is this is an archery podcast, right? Just to remind myself, I'm eh, it's blast. okay to change it up. <laughs> uh, I gotta ask you. I gotta ask you, Rick. Uh, on a serious note, <clears throat> Roger Clemens. So I I grew up a, a Red Sox fan. So you know, naturally, I hated the Yankees. So I have a, a little bit of a, a long distance relationship with Roger Clemens. How do you feel about that situation? What situation, well, in particular? Well, in his career. Yeah, you know, it, it not not getting in the Hall of Fame and all that he did. Well, those guys like Palmero, like Barry Bonds, like Mark McGuire, you know, even throw Pete Rose in there. Those guys that blatantly cheated are going to have a hard time. They just are. You know, this last day and a half, I've been listening to Hank Aaron since he passed away. Rest in peace, Big Hank. He. He was talking about uh, these guys. How do you feel about the steroid errors? He goes, it shouldn't count. You know, I know how hard it is to hit 39, 35, 42 home runs every year for 20 years like Hank Aaron did. And he goes, it's not humanly possible to hit 70 home runs, hit 60-something home runs year after year. You know, Barry Bonds at 73. It's ridiculous. Now, Grant, he had the greatest hand-eye and back quickness ever, but he had a little help. He had a little help. He wasn't out there naked, as they say. He had a little help. 
and Roger Clemens, it was pretty much proven that he uh, dabbled in that too. But like I said, so many guys were doing and it wasn't illegal at first. And then it became illegal by that time. Everybody's hooked in it. And the pitchers are thinking, well, if the batters are doing it, I'm going to do it. And the batters are thinking, well, if Clemens is going to do it. I'm going to do it. So, you know, I don't get caught up in it. It is what it is. It was an error in baseball. Uh, and it did bring the sport back around when Sammy Sosa and McGuire were hitting all those home runs and all that. It was exciting. And that's what the fans want to see. But no, you guy like, you know, Babe Ruth, you know, was he out there? He was probably drunk or on amphetamines. It's not a lot of those guys. Nobody's out there very often, you know, alone. They're out there. They got a little speed. They got a little truck stop. They drink monster. They're doing something just, it's a grind. So they're doing something to keep that edge. Just like if I go on an all day, you know, sit in a tree stand, I'm probably going to have a five hour power. I need a little something to help me keep awake. But those performing enhancing drugs in the uh, 90s and early 2000s, they were something else. And from what I hear from the reliable source, guys are still doing them today. But they have these chemists and scientists that are coming up with these concoctions that will help you uh, stay strong. Uh, retain your strength throughout the season, stay sharp that, you know, they can't detect. So that's why once or twice a year, somebody's still getting caught, but there's still guys doing something to get that edge. And they're just trying to be the best they can for themselves and make a big paycheck for their family and help their team win. Well, I guess that's the thing is it's a compounding problem. Once, you know, there's a few guys doing it and capitalizing on it. Everybody feels like, well, Hey, I, I want to get my piece of the pie. And I'm assuming that they probably – what you were alluding to is, is juice all off season and then get off of it and try and maintain that during the season. I'll do it. When I, it was explained to me, you know, guys that would do it during, you know, all those uh, recordings and all those TV shows in – after I retired in 98, they were talking – they'll, you know, there's six weeks on, six weeks off, Then, but there's no telling what is out there, whether it's uh, – steroids or uh, human growth hormones or just blood doping, all that stuff. No telling what is out there now and available. And, uh, but it just, the game is not as innocent as, you know, back in the day, but even back in the day, those guys were probably doing something as well to just stay alert, stay awake, stay strong. It's a grueling long season. It was never grueling for me. I sat the bench all the time. I never damn played enough, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you guys are playing, you know, 150 games out of 162 long season, you know, 175 days uh, flying and traveling, traveling, flying and home and away and night. It's tough. It's tough. So that's why it's so impressive. These guys can hit 40 home runs and bat 350. They are so sharp for such a extended period of time that it's impressive. Yeah, it's it's hard for me to even wrap my head around because I know how how much of a grind, you know, a three or four day tournament used to be uh you caught four or five games in two or three days you know you that, that was a beat down oh and, no doubt especially on astroturf now almost every college field and even nice high school fields that my uh, travel ball teams play on in the summer are astroturf or sport turf and in the middle of summer that's extra hot out there yeah it's nice and you don't get rained out and you got a smooth surface but behind the plate some of them are dirt but most of them are even pitching mound and catching area and home plate everything is turf now it's kind of weird you got to use the block the ball doesn't stay down when you block the ball as you know it bounces up and it's kind of a circus back there but yeah you got a double hitter in the heat of an Oklahoma summer you better rest your catcher you better hydrate you better have a cooler full of ice towels and you got a dugout dad or mom or whatever babysitting these kids and keeping them sharp no doubt do you ever get to catch anybody who was a submarine pitcher? Just went way down low. Yeah, I did. Uh, I'm trying to think. I don't think I did at the big league level, but I caught a kid in uh, in A ball, double A, and triple A that threw. Uh, he wasn't a real tall, lanky guy, but he did throw under, and he was awesome. He, when he came in, the game was over. And then uh, uh, I faced those guys, and I hated them. Because it's hard enough just to hit a normal fastball curveball. Now you got this slider coming from behind you, circling around. Uh, the last day of my season in 1989, I had a good game against the Cardinals. I went three for four with a, a home run and a bloop single. 
uh, off Dan Quisenberry. And it was a broken bat bloop RBI single in like the eighth inning. It was kind of a close game. We ended up winning. But they took him out of the game. Uh, then he retired after that off season, And then uh, he passed away of cancer six or seven years after that. But uh, I was the last guy, believe it or not, poor guy. He probably retired. If I could get a freaking hit off of him, he probably <laughs> figured it was time to hang him up. But yeah, <laughs> I, I faced those guys in the minor leagues, and I hated them. And so now on my teams I coach, if you have a kid that, you know, these high schoolers and college kids are throwing, you know, 85, 92 – if you got that really good, tall, lanky pitcher that's only throwing 79 to 83, I have them drop down, and they'll get a scholarship. They may not get a full ride, but every college team wants one, has to have one. They don't get a full ride. They may get a third scholarship or whatever, but they got to have them because every coach knows that every hitter hates to face them, and there's times you can bring them in for an inning or an out or maybe two or three innings or a spot start. They're just so difficult because who trains off hitting that? You know, even if it's not a true sinker, it's just a gravity ball, you you don't practice hitting that. It's just tough, kind of like a knuckleball. or Anything that's different and off-speed is tough to hit. One summer we were traveling around Texas, and uh, there was some guy, a few guys that, uh, like you're saying, they may have been tall, lanky guys that didn't throw it very hard, and somebody was having them drop down trying to learn how to how to pitch that way, and I hated it, absolutely hated it. They're easy to catch. I love catching them because they have a big sweeping slider that's easy to catch. They don't bounce many balls. Even their sinker, you know, you see it coming. It's kind of easy to block. Uh, the guys that are difficult to catch are guys uh, – I got a cup of coffee for a couple months with the Cincinnati Reds in 92, and I caught Norm Charlton and Rob Dibble back-to-back. So if you were ahead in the game, Dibble pitched the eighth, throwing 101, and he, had, he gripped his slider real tight. And if you ever thrown a breaking ball and you grip it too tight and you throw it real hard, it, it kind of starts to curve and then it backs up. That was his pitch. He did it on purpose. It was so a right hand hitter will see a slider and adjust because they're work on hitting a slider and it backs up underneath you like a screwball. It was crazy. And then he threw 101 on top of it and he was on something. I don't know what he was on, but he was a little, he was a little hyped up. He was, and then Norm Charlton came in and threw the nastiest freaking spit ball or vagisil ball or slurpy derpy ball. I don't know what it was, but <laughs> I'd throw the ball back to him. And if he had his bare hand on his belt buckle, as I was throwing it to him, I knew the next pitch was to call a spit ball. <laughs> and it just came in at 90 and just boom, hit the dirt every time. I just gave a target, got ready to block, gave a target, boom, block, gave a target. And he'd save it. You know, he might throw two in a row, but typically wait till it get, you know, two strikes, and it was just – the game was over. He was he was the toughest competitor I've ever been around. That, that's uh, Both of those guys were, were crazy, mean, and nasty. And, of course, a couple of years before that, they were called the Nasty Boys when they won the World Series in 1990. Were, when somebody got on first, uh, were they guaranteed second? Were you easy to steal on? Hell no. <laughs> Dude, when you bat 220 – you better be able to throw somebody's ass out. <laughs> now, there are a few times guys got me, and it really ticked me off. Uh, but that's pretty much the only reason why I got to the big leagues, because I was one of those, you know, I'm, I'm 6'1", 185 pounds, uh, and, you know, fast and athletic, real wire. Remember Benito Santiago, how skinny and wire he was? In that era of the late 80s, early 90s, there was a couple – shortstop looking guys that were catching behind the plate, you know, not the Pudge Fisk and Pudge Rodriguez stocky, powerful guys. There was a few skinny guys like me. So because of my athleticism, you know, I was never a good hitter, but I either led the league and throwing runners out or was, you know, the top two or three in the, in a ball and in double a, and then the year I got called up to big leagues, I threw out 50% of the runners in triple a. So that helped me. And I actually did hit 265. So I wasn't a total embarrassment at the plate. So they called me up. And because of some injuries I to some better players, better catchers, I stuck up there for a couple of years with the Cubs. But I threw very well, picked some guys off. Boy, I picked Kirby Puckett off one time. Oh, no he kidding. Asked about it, and that was quite the thrill. <laughs> and he told me, hey, man, don't be thrown down there, man. You know, my big ass didn't want to move around. And, <laughs> and first baseman actually put it on. I wasn't going to do it. You know, Hall of Famer, end of his career, he's a little chunky down there, and he's having trouble with his eyesight. <laughs> And the first baseman put the sign on, and which normally I would put it on, but I backpicked him and got him and 
he came up and gave me shit the next time to play, but I think he hit a home run. So he got the last laugh there. But, uh, but Tony Gwynn with the Padres towards the end of his career, he was getting a little thick around the middle. But he was such a good ball player, so smart. But instead of being, you know, 200 pounds, he was probably 230. But that sucker could still run. And he stole a base off me. And, you know, the guy had a good jump. He took, went on a break, a ball. I didn't get a good grip. He got it easy. But it doesn't matter whether it's the pitcher's fault or my fault. Still a stolen base against me. But he got me. And, I got razzed pretty hard by getting a stolen base to the slowest, oldest, fattest guy in the league. But that's okay. He's a Hall of Famer. I can live with that. <laughs> oh, that's funny. You got any good stories from back traveling around in your single A, double A, triple A minor league ball? Yeah, people told me I need to write a book like I was saying earlier, but I've got a few. Uh... Any, any that you can tell? Uh, one comes to mind and I probably cannot tell that's a Bo Jackson story you Can't played with did you ever did you ever get to hunt with Bo I I asked him a couple times in spring training I went to spring training with the White Sox in 93 and when I first got there the pitchers and catchers arrive early you know a week or 10 days early and as soon as I got there I hit it off with a couple uh, pitchers and I'm a golfer and a hunter, but they, Hey man, Hey Ron, we got T we got, we're going to go TPS sawgrass. Let's go out there. We're going to go here. We're going to go here. And it's always a freebie and they're buying beers. I'm like, yeah, you're driving to hell of a deal. I'll sign me up. So uh, we, you know, get there at eight and leave at noon and tee off at one o'clock. This is before game started. So I, I was in the golfing. Well, when the players started showing up, uh, I, you know, introduced, I didn't ever know Bo, but I went introduced myself and he's man, a few words, but, uh, so we only got to know each other. I got to know him a little bit better just because he was not a starting player at that time. And the, once the game started, you had the starting lineup hits, you know, the first three, then the second three, then the last three. But before that, the scrubinis that aren't playing that day hit. So I took a lot of batting practice in the scrubini group with, uh, Bo Jackson. I had a couple of home run contests with him and I'd hit a few and he'd hit when I'd hit a few and I'm up four to two with the last round, he'd hit like six in a row out that never landed and you know i i know what you were thinking uh ricky Rowe. you 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 were about to tell your grandkids how, how you kicked my ass in a home run derby well, weren't you and i was like yeah that's kind of what i was thinking bro you're exactly right anyway he spoke real deliberately he stuttered when he was a kid and he, he figured it out but he speaks real deliberately and man what a great individual great man i still follow him he's doing a lot of bicycling across alabama and fundraising stuff i'm sure he's doing a lot of hunting but i've reached out to him on instagram but when you're a superstar like that i don't even think he runs his own account because i've hit him up a couple times and dm'd him and dropped my cell number and he hadn't got back to me but we had some good outings but back to the spring training he would go hog i'd go golfing and he went hog hunting and i only knew it because uh Every morning I'd come in and I'd hear him on the phone talking to Easton. I'm like, who Easton, like the arrow company? He's like, yeah, I'm having them send me another dozen arrows. I'm like, wh- wh- what are you doing? Are you practicing? What, what are you uh, hog hunting? And, you know, it's real thick and swamps. So you shoot at a hog, you miss it. You don't even look for your arrows. And he was in the thick of them. He finally killed a big sucker. Our clubhouse guy, Willie, this is what I was with the White Sox in 93. He picked that big sucker and cooked it all day long and all night long. We had the next day. It was it was amazing. So right before the end of spring training, when I got to know Bo and got to be a little bit chummy with him, talk bow hunting, by that time it was serious. Baseball was a little bit more serious towards the end of spring training. And he quit going as much, and and uh, I never played with him or again. But uh, that was the end of that deal. We were walking across the field one time in Cleveland, and, again, we're – in the scrubini group and there's no batting practice on the field because they're having an event. So we were taking batting practice in the tunnel. And at that time, you know, Bo was it, the Nike campaign, Bo knows that commercial with him being a race car driver and a jockey and all that in the early nineties. I mean, nobody on earth was bigger than him. And I'm hanging out with this dude. I'm in the scrubini batting group with him. And at that time, Frank Thomas was, you know, American league MVP, the best player in the American league. But as the biggest star Frank was, you know, Frank, 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 autograph people yelling at him, yelling at him, wherever he went. Wherever. Once anybody saw Bo Jackson, Bo, 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 it was deafening. So we're walking across the field one time, and they just let the fans in. 
and people are just around the bum rash, the part of the, the stadium where we were walking. And he goes, Ricky Rowe, I would trade my popularity with you in a heartbeat and throwing a toaster. I'm like, come on, man. What do you mean, Bo? What are you trying to say, Bo? He goes, you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> he was a, a freaking superstar like none other. And I would love to love to reacquaint with him, and even if it was just a, a chat on a, a text. Did you ever hear the stories about when the went uh was it Barry Wenzel hunting with uh, Bo Jackson? I I know of that story, but I can't remember if I've seen that on YouTube. Oh or no, on a- no, it's only on audio. And and Barry Wenzel is funnier than hell. Of the both of the Wenzels are, um, I'll have to dig that up and see if I still have it. It's like on and seriously, it's on cassette tape. Wow. Yeah, if I can dig that up and find a way to. Yeah, I don't know if it's still out there. It's hysterical. I, uh, I I know I told you this talking to you a month ago, the late, great archery legend from Tulsa, Oklahoma, Jim Doherty, that passed away in 2015. He had an archery shop, and that's where I bought my gear, and I shot a Pope and Young deer, and he scored it for me, and I got to be buddies with him as he got on in his age and took him duck hunting and deer hunted a couple times. He went on one of those celebrity uh deer hunts in Texas, deer and hog hunts with Bo Jackson a long time ago. I bet that was a hell of a deal. Um, how about, I grew up idolizing Carlton Fisk. You got any Carlton Fisk stories? I got called up uh, in 93 at the White Sox. Uh, one of the catchers got hurt, so Carlton Fisk is the backup catcher, and he's about ready to break the all-time games caught uh, record. But his, I think he's, man, he's in his low 40s, 42, yeah. 44-ish. I mean, he played a long time. Still great athlete, good shape. But his, uh, he had a bad wrist, left thumb action, so he was he was not receiving the ball very well. So they, they played him sparingly. They wanted him to break the record. So when uh, he broke the record, I happened to be uh, uh, the other catcher on the team at that time. Uh, and there was another catcher, a third-string catcher. So there were three of us. But they knew in a tight game, if their starting catcher, Ron Karkovice, got hurt, that most likely I would go in, you know, defensive late in the game. But every once in a while, they would start him to break that record. And sure enough, he broke the record. And a couple of days later in Cleveland, they, uh, they released him. They called him to Cleveland for the purpose of releasing him. They should have done it home and let the guy go out in a big retirement with a little more class. But they, they did not. They uh, released him on the road. And uh, well, after he broke the record, they did give him a Harley Davidson, and Bo Jackson wrote it out there. That was a big deal. But the next week, we went to Cleveland, and they released him. He came uh, in the middle of the game. He emptied out – well, before coming to the game, he emptied out his hotel bar, <laughs> takes a cab to the ballpark, muscles his way by all the clubhouse kids, comes into our dugout, and Bo Jackson and Frank Thomas, two biggest humans on earth, barely corral this big guy because Pudge was a big man too. He wanted to rip the coaches, you know, rip them a new one for being classless, and he's drunk. And they said, hey, no, get back there, get back there. Well, they just chill out, go back to the hotel. Well, instead of going back to the hotel, I guess he made his way out to the center field and the big drum at Cleveland, at the old mistake at the lake, that ballpark. There was a bad drum beat going out in deep center field, and all the players were looking like, what is going on? Because normally that guy kept a pretty good beat. Well, <laughs> Carlton Fisk was drunker than a skunk up there beating on the drums in the <laughs> center field in Cleveland. And then uh, then he made his way to the bullpen. He almost fell over the fence, high five and his buddies in the bullpen. And I, I, I was down there for that. And I was like, this guy is something else. What's going on? So I had to be caught up to speed all right. Well, he got released. He's not happy. He's a little, a little liquidated right now. Anyway, so long story getting longer. We, uh, Bo and Frank and Robin Ventura and a couple guys. Uh, we had a big party at a down on the landing in uh, in Cleveland there at the world's largest strip club that I've ever been to at that point in my life. And uh, yeah, I think about twenty strippers rode him around in his tidy whities on stage. And yeah, that was uh, that that those memories will never leave my brain. I will tell you that. <laughs> I'd imagine not. That's funny. <laughs> So what made you originally, like what, what kind of clicked with you to 
to start picking up the stick bow. Just looking for so something I else. Threw into the McAllister Ammunition Depot. Oh, that's right. We already and talked about I knew that. I've talked to enough people, you know, in the last 10 or 12 years, because I've been, you know, bow hunting for since 1989. So uh, for 20 years, I've been hearing, oh, you got to do it, you got to do it. Well, I just either forgot or didn't do it or didn't get drawn in. And I don't think it's quite like a point system. Maybe it was, maybe, but anyway. But a good high school buddy said, hey, let's put in, let's put in. So that's when. So I got the bow, and that was about five years ago. Went, didn't have any luck. Went two years later. Had a lot of bucks coming by, but just no shooters, just dinks. And they actually, this time, they had, if you shoot a buck that's 115 inches or bigger, we'll let you keep that, and you can go ahead and shoot uh, a trophy buck, too. So you have two bucks, which that's very rare, on top of being able to shoot a doe or a hog. So it's a pretty unique deal. So anyway, I just did that. And then as, as well as I was shooting that Samick Sage and I was, uh, you know, doing string crawling and I never got into 3d stuff. I was just doing the backyard and hunting, but, uh, I was tinkering with all that and, and listened to all the YouTube guys and got in the podcast and I was still elk hunting, but I, I wouldn't take it elk hunting. I was taking my Hoyt. Uh, anyway, I just finally wanted to get something, just prettier to look at a little smoother. And like I said, that guy talked me into it. So I got a black widow after I shot him a bunch and I bought this one. And I think I started to say, not only is it, you know, it's probably the hardest one there is to shoot. Cody recommended that I get a a 64 inch PMA. And so uh, about three months ago, I ordered one. I called Roger and I told him why I am. Hey, I'm the sales guy that comes down there and looks at your stuff, never buys anything, but I have, this PSR and it's, it's finicky. It's tough to shoot. When I'm in the zone, I can shoot it, you know, in the backyard, but I'm missing here and wounded one here. I want something like Cody's calls a shooter. I mean, a shooter. It's forgiving. It's deflex, longer limbs. It's this, the grip to this, and put a rest on all this stuff. So, uh, Cody got me fired up to try it. So I called those guys. They got that great test drive program. And Roger goes, Hey man, all our left-handed bows are out. 50, we don't have anything, uh, you know, near what you want, 50 pounds left-handed. Uh, so we need to make another one for our bow rack, whether you want or not, we'll ship, we'll make it for you, your spec, we'll ship it to you. If you don't want it, ship it back. No big deal. We need to have it. And if you don't like it, hell, we'll make you another one. You know, I just think that's the greatest. So I said, yeah, make me 50, uh, 50 inch, excuse me, 50 pounds. Uh, uh, Cody recommended, oh, Cody, oh, Cody's getting me going, huh? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> He says it's a shooter. Oh, he'll know. He knows. So 64 inch uh, PMA, and I'm and I'm like Cody. Sure, I don't want to shoot something like Snyder shoots that little PSA 62 inch, a little shorter riser, longer land. Da, da. He goes, no, I'm just trust me. You want a shooter? This is it. Well, I didn't give it any thought, but I'm going from the the shortest, hardest shooting bow Black Widow makes to the longest, heaviest, you know, let's call it the most forgiving bow they make. So I got it. It shot well, but I just, I couldn't get used to it. It was just huge and bulky and heavy and just, but if I really wanted to be the most accurate archer I could probably be, that's probably what I would go with and shoot it. But I just, uh, I was having surgery scheduled. It was time for me to send it back and I wasn't going on any other hunting trips. So I, I sent it back to Black Widow and thank Roger and said, I'm going to test drive something else next spring, maybe the, the PCH model or something that's a little more compact, but does have a little meat on the handle, something a little more forgiving. But, uh, but then as soon as I do that, I go out in the backyard and even went hog hunting with Cody down South. And I made three incredible shot, incredible for me shots, you know, at night at hogs. I mean, there's a hog at a feeder at night and they, these night lights come on, but those hogs know where those lights are. So they stay on the other side of the feeder. So you barely see a black silhouette of a hog and I punched three of them. And, uh, I was like, you know what, this thing's so beautiful, so light. Uh, when I took it elk hunting this year, I'm what's it weigh a pound and a half, maybe pound and a half with full quiver. It was amazing. I loved it. Of course I got bad knee, just had back surgery. I got a hiking stick in one hand and a little recurve in the other hand. I enjoy, I don't care if I ever shoot an elk, the the enjoyment of not carrying that 10 pound boat anchor around was amazing. And then, but it's just going to be a matter of time till some big six boy, six point walks by me like a uh, old stalker stick bow. He shot one last year at six yards. It's going to happen one of these days. I can call pretty good. I, I know a couple areas. I'm going with a buddy in that area. 
uh, in Colorado. I'm going to get one one of these days. I've shot three elk in Oklahoma. Uh, we have an elk herd here, small, different parts of the state. And you, if you get landowner permission and there's a small herd that happens to come by, you're, you're able to shoot it. So I've shot two spikes and a cow, but those are all with my compound. And this year the herd didn't come across the Illinois River from a 28,000 acre, 28,000 acre uh, nature conservancy to my buddy's 200 acres where I've been killing them. But, oh, well, I'll get one again. But I still got some elk meat in the freezer, and I, I really want to get one in the back country. You know, I got my Kafaro backpack, and I'm up there in the woods, and I've got a lightweight tent, and me and my son or a buddy, and, and doing, it the, doing it the hard way. I can't wait. It'll happen. But I get this knee going, and I'll get back up in there, and, and hopefully it happens. So you you think you'll be good to go for this year? Oh, hell yeah. Last year I went, uh, you know, that last uh, September 17th through the 28th, and that was 11 weeks after back surgery. Probably was not advisable, but uh, my doctor said, oh, yeah, you know, if your buddies are going to drive you down there to a water hole and ATV and sit, yeah, you can sit there. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. (laughs) No, we were hiking. We were, you know. It was a drawing unit, but there's no side by side. It was, you know, minimum three mile walk in and then set up camp and then hike five miles in a big circle and do that. But I had a backpack on which stabilized my back. I always had a hiking uh, stick, if not two, you know, for hiking in the dark there in the back, I'd strap my PSR in my backpack and, and 60 inches. It wasn't too bad. It wasn't too long or most of the time I would just carry it. But if we had to go on a long hike in or out and, and cover some ground and cover some speed, I'd strap it on there, and that worked great. I ruffled a few feathers on some limbs, so a, a takedown would, would probably be much better. But it worked out great. And around camp, man, I was so wired up. I was stump shooting and leaf shooting and pine cone shooting. And I finally I, – backyard, I can only shoot to, you know, 38 yards. I was shooting 48, 49 yards, which I finally found out my point on at a pine cone with a – a rubber thumper is it's about 48 yards because I'm the way I'm holding and three finger under, but man, I, I killed my limit of pine cones. Never did see a grouse, unfortunately. And I called in a bull to 90 yards and I went to a spot where I knew they'd be coming down from a couple of years ago. They made answer and I call and sneak in on him. Well, I let him, he bugled first. I answered. And I sat there on that damn water hole like a dummy instead of running up 60, 70 yards on the edge of that tree line where he had to pop out. Sure enough, he popped his head out. He's big six on one side and a funky four on the other side. And I just watched him at 90 yards stare at me for a couple minutes. But I had a decoy next to me or over my shoulder, kind of blowing in the wind, cow, and he could care less. They, he wasn't hot enough, but uh, I, I know I can do it. I'll get it done. Yeah, well, Cody, he's there's no doubt that those big long bows are are a little easier to shoot, but man, I I've messed around with with them enough to know that I don't have, have any interest in dragging one around in the woods. I I like my 60 to 62 inch bows and think I I'm getting a PSA, so 60 inch PSA just kind of right there in the middle. Oh, that'd be perfect. That'd be perfect. Those guys at Black Widow are incredible. Yeah, those guys knew me. Uh, I introduced myself, knew I was a sales guy. Hey, what, you know, you want to come back? You want to see how we're made? I mean, they weren't trying to oversell me. They were just saying, what, what can we help you with? You know, uh, John and, and uh, uh, Essex Toby. guys, both those guys, they were so, so helpful. They watched me shoot in the lobby and, hey, just, hey, are you going to be here for a minute? We got to answer the phone. Just make yourself at home. And I shot and I shot and I shot and asked questions and shot. And like I said, bought a finger tab is about it. And then I, once I got that, that used bow, you know, I bought a Selway quiver from them there, which I bought a couple of those now. And I, I bought a big long bow at a pawn shop for a hundred bucks. That's a 55, uh, 55 pound long bow. It was made in Texas. Uh, I can't think of the name of it, but it was about an $800 bow, but it's a hell of a hiking stick. I can't believe how 55 pounds is that much more stout. You know, you're never supposed to leave those long bows uh, strung, right? Well, it's been strung for about two years. <laughs> Hopefully I can shoot it comfortably here in a couple of years. It's just fun, man. But it's, there's this, this bow I'm shooting now. I missed a doe three times this year. And finally I said, man, sh- 
I missed her three times. She deserves to live. I last thing I want to do is wound her after missing three times. <laughs> it just, I mean, there was no wind. It was so quiet. They just, they barely move. And the arrows stick in there with the luminoc lit, you know, and they walk right back into a little corn I had sprinkled down on the old PVC pipe feeder. They're just so quiet. And the first buck I ever did kill with my Samick Sage, I missed him. I aimed low at 20 yards thinking he would duck a little bit because, you know, they would with a my Hoyt. They'd duck four or five inches. So you aim, you know, heart, bottom of heart, and they'd duck right into it. I aimed right underneath his armpit. That arrow went right underneath his armpit. He just jaunted around, did a little circle, and five, six minutes later, he came right back in right before dark. And I throttled them. That was so dang exciting. So you get, I love a target rich environment. And then especially when you can, uh, you know, foul one off and swing and a miss at a dirt ball. And then, you know, before you get strike three connect, that's a hell of a deal. <laughs> Rick, <laughs> how, how old are your kids? My kids? Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. How my old are your kids? Oldest, my oldest is 30. Will lives in Denver, Colorado. Uh, He's kind of a hippie. He's got a great soul, great heart. He, I'm actually missing a ski trip. We were supposed to go skiing this weekend, but my knees jacked up. So uh, a friend of mine let us use his condo. So he's up there having a good time. He and his fiance, he's 30. Uh, he's killed a couple deer back when he was 13 and 14 before he got into, you know, girls and more high school sports. And then my youngest son who lives here in Tulsa, uh, he's a horticulturist at a, a big place down here at the river parks. Walter, he is a bow hunter. He still hunts. And uh, I bought a really nice used uh, right-handed uh, Martin Savannah yep. reflex, reflex at a pawn shop that is immaculate. And I, I can shoot right-handed. I shot a little bit right-handed. I'm not accurate, but I can do it. And sometimes I do it just to keep my muscle strong on both sides. Like a lot of baseball players that only hit right-handed and throw right-handed, the doctor's always at, hey, you know, I know you can't throw left hand, but swing left handed, just like warming up with golf, swing left hand, just get your muscles loose. So I will do that every now and then, but it is so smooth and so quiet. And it's probably an $800 bow, brand new taxing and sh taxes and shipping and everything. I Googled it. So I went to this pawn shop and I offered him $200. He said, no way, dude, this is, anyway, I ended up giving $450 for it. So hopefully my youngest Walter will shoot it. But my son, Will came home from Christmas last year from Denver Went out there, hey, tab, three under, kind of the corner of your face, 15 yards, boom, boom. He started thumping it, and he really was like, Dad, this is awesome. I said, son, you live in Colorado. You live outside of Denver. You can be in the woods and, you know, kind of a hippie dude. You don't want to be buying meat at Walmart. You can be killing and grilling some cool stuff. And what's it, I don't know, in-state tag can't be very much. So one, he's going to come elk hunting with me. And my other son, Walt, this year, I don't know if he'll buy a tag or a license or hunt, but he'll take the weekend off and storm around. He likes to camp, likes to get outdoors, likes to hike. He and his fiance do a lot of hiking. So he's, I'm going to get him into it, trust me. But Walter's into it. We duck hunt a lot uh, and then deer hunt a little bit. He, uh, he shot a couple uh, almost Pope and Young bucks real close after deduction. They probably netted over 125, excuse me, gross, but didn't quite net. But a couple of beautiful bucks on the wall and then, but he's not into you know shooting does and getting out there and just shooting anything that moves like I was when I was 25. But so he's a little more calm, cool, and collected. He's like, I think he just likes enjoying his old man and seeing me get a kick in the pants and getting up in the tree and videotape each other and ride around with four wheelers and checking cameras and, and hanging out and shooting some coyotes and whatnot. So we enjoy our time together. That's a heck of a good looking white tail you got there in the background. This one here is really nice. Uh, I didn't ever have a picture of it, but it's a 15 pointer. He grosses a little over 150, but he's got all these little doodads and this and that. So I think he went like 131 inches, you know, unofficial. I had him officially scored, but I didn't enter him. I got one that my buddy Jim Doherty did, this giant eight point up here. That is a. When I shot him yeah. in 2002, the taxidermist said, man, don't, don't tell anybody where you brought this. I'm like, well, what are you talking about? It's like 138 inch eight point, the biggest thing I've ever killed. But oh, people break in. I'm like, what are you, hey, that's 160 inch deer. I'm like, you're probably not a very good taxidermist. But anyway, I measured him, ended up being about 42, I thought. But when Jim Doherty officially measured him, which I have the, uh, 
record book there. Oh yeah. Yeah, he he netted one forty six and seven eighths. What he gross? Oh, wow. What he yeah. gross? He grossed one fifty and seven eighths. Yeah. That's a heck of an eight point. He's just such a big bodied and big headed deer that the antlers just look like a really nice eight point rack. But you know, the brows are over six inches and twos are a little over ten and then eight threes and his mass is unbelievable. His mass is a better mass than the world record deer. That Milo Hansen deer or whatever, he's got better mass than that. So his mass is absolutely sick. But anyway, I it's been a long time since I killed one that big and then so, you know, about every 20 years I get on the board, but I've got some exotics up there that I've shot with Bo from some high fence ranches in Texas. I would take some clients out in the steel business and take them out there, and they're all got rifles and, you know, big Texicans driving around all day looking. I would sit in my tree and wait for one to come by, and I'd snipe it with the bow, and I'd <laughs> be the only guy in the whole camp to get something. And But they had a good time, and they drank some beers, and, sipped on a little whiskey but uh i got a couple axis deer and a and a black buck and but you know a lot of controversy with those high fence deers and i was kind of the same way you know shooting fish in the barrel i guess it's not it's not now maybe some are 200 acres 100 acres maybe but the places i've got eleven thousand acres high fenced on three sides that's hardly shooting fish in the barrel and the other one was 3500 acres you get lost there's people coming from mexico they have to lock their uh, their deer blinds every night because the gentlemen from Mexico are cutting through their fences and spend the night getting water out of their tanks and sleeping in the blinds. And I mean, it, it's it just all depends, you know. But here in Oklahoma, I got 200 acres I can hunt and throw some corn out there. I'm going to get a shot at something. I mean, it's it's not high fence, but you know, it's all relative to how you set it up and work it and what you want to accomplish. But again, my favorite thing to do, and I've got that big buck and one other one in another room is to hunt them over decoys. You know, yeah, there may be a feed or 50 or hundred yards around and keep those does over there, but you get downwind of that feed or a hundred, 200 yards and throw out a buck decoy. To me, that's, that's the ultimate, you know, you get to see some does cause you know, they're in the area, but you're going to have some bucks coming downwind, scent checking those does, the bedding, and then they see your decoy and they come in and get throttled, you know, at 15 yards. I haven't done it with the recurve yet, but, I'm going to. I did it out of a duck blind this year. We had a really nice duck blind. I've been wanting to do that for years. So a big uh, field with some uh, millet planted, and the deer were hammering it. But it wasn't quite rut yet. But I put a buck decoy out, and I had another buck decoy. I sit down in the millet on the ground where you could just see the top of its head, so it looked like a, a buck and a doe there. But nothing came in. It was windy and rainy, but I did it for half a day. But it's going to happen. And I'm going to videotape, but it's going to be awesome. What area of Oklahoma do you hunt, if you don't mind me don't mind me asking? No, no. I, I uh, live in Tulsa, so that's northeast Oklahoma. Right. My uh, my dearest and greatest mother-in-law, Leanne, she has a lake house on Fort Gibson Lake. And part of the housing community, 10 or 15 homes, there's two or 300 acres, uh, 220 acres of uh, Corps of Engineer land, which is just land around the lake. Mm-hmm. that their little housing community has, uh, I know, gets to use or sublease or whatever. And it's it's no hunting to the general public, but the homeowners, you know, can sneak out there and hunt a little bit. And so uh, there's maybe me and one other guy that, that hunts it. And, you know, there's a couple of nice bucks every now and then. And I've shot a couple of big ones out there and, uh, and uh, wounded a really nice one this year, hit him in the back strap and he got away. But, there's some nice deer, but then the main place I go where there's some really like booners and bunch of Pope and young deer is an hour West of me right between Tulsa and Oklahoma city is a town called Stroud mm-hmm. and about 10 miles South of Stroud on this deep fork river. My buddy owns a thousand acres and it's a beautiful ranch. It's mostly a wild uh, waterfowl refuge that he's built for the last 15 years and the uh, NRCS has put in flooded pools and ponds and drainages. So I helped him do a lot of work with that. And, uh, we had some protein feeders going out there with uh, 40 foot diameter, uh, fencing around to keep the hogs out. And occasionally a loose cow or horse gets out, but mostly to keep the hogs out. So it's about time for me to get down there and take a couple panels off those feeders. And so those hogs can start coming by because the deer won't eat that protein. They want to go near those feeders if the hogs are, 
coming in or been in. So no, uh, it's that it's that time of year. I, I usually this time of year start taking a panel off all the all the feeder pins so the hogs can get in them. <laughs> oh well, you're out. You're in Texas. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, I'm just buddies, north I'm of. Uh, he didn't think just, they'd touch that protein. I said, well, they will if we protect it. Well, put a fence around it. And they've been hammered for four years. Now, just no big bucks come into it yet, but a bunch of young bucks. So over the last four or five years, a bunch of young bucks know where they can get a, a meal. But we got some nice food plots. He works really hard, manages his property. It's beautiful. Probably got 10 or 12 different locations. But the main thing I like to do is get on the edge of those uh, wheat fields and, uh, or, you know, and put a decoy out and, Hopefully something runs by chasing something and you rattle or grunt and they catch your attention and, and come by and, and get a stab at one. But the hogs, I'm ready. I can barely walk, but I know I can have him drop me off two feet from my ladder and I can hobble up a, a ladder stand and sit there till dark or maybe even after, I guarantee it. And then I got, we, we shoot some after dark with thermal imaging stuff. I don't have, they're pretty expensive. I just have a night vision scope, but that's good enough to shoot some beavers and occasional hog but the night vision at other places where i took cody cody thought he wasn't interested in that but he, he called us many many names that i cannot mention on on radio because uh he's so committed at stick bow he thought we were savages driving around after not after dark with thermal imaging he hadn't dealt with the damn pigs enough yet that's what it is we asked him if he wanted to no no nope. of course he he when we came hunting he was uh had the uh the Cody show, he had the travel trailer and his wife was working with him. So she, she'd been there most of the day by herself. So I get it. He didn't want to spend any more time out with a couple of knuckle higgs driving around Southern Oklahoma on wheat fields on every ranch in America. Yeah. So it's fun. I kinda, but, uh, I'm kind of thinking that Oklahoma might be like North Idaho. So I might have to come down there and uh, we, we might really get along good. It is a target rich environment yeah. and it's pretty, pretty flat. Easy to get around on unless, you know, it rains a lot. But down that part of Oklahoma, dude, it does not rain very often. But it is a target-rich environment with pigs. And uh, and there's some really nice deer down there, turkeys too. So it's really fun to go down there and go pig hunting, you know, in April. Because, of, of course, it's illegal to shoot uh, turkeys by a feeder. But if you there's a feeder there and you shoot a hog and you go there and you're tired of shooting the hogs, you can get set up between those wheat fields and the feeders and and the you'll get a turkey to come by and maybe whack one of those and occasionally hog too. You can spot and stalk the hogs on some of those places because you just got to know where they bed and where they like to sleep around where all the the sloughs are and the creeks and crap where it's cool. Yeah, it don't get a whole lot more fun than spotting and stalking pigs, especially at night. I love doing it at night. Well, I have not done that, but they he says they've done it before because you get the wind right and you drive 200 yards from them and they're right there with thermal and you see them. You, okay, get your bow. He's done it with his kid and they have a light on their uh, uh, on the on the bow and he'll draw a point toward the sky and he'll just come down real soft and that light will hit the hog. And he'll stop and he'll look and then boom, you you know, they'll range it and he range it in the dark. Okay. It's your 30 yards. So he knows what pin he's got his light on his pin and he comes down with that little light, green light or red light, whatever. They've tried a couple of them. They whack a few at night, just walking on weeds. I've not done that with a bow. That would be awesome. Now Cody is definitely excited about the Eagles. Next time we're for sure doing that. I'm like, I'm in Hoss. That's yeah. That's I'm that's who I thought you were talking about was Cody. Yeah. That's what he and I and uh, Bill from iron will and, Cameron did last spring just drive around and look at the wheat fields at night with a thermal and all had lights mounted to our bows and I mean I the one night I was really excited and I told Cody I was super excited because the wind was going to be blowing about 20 mile an hour all night and uh he wasn't sure I, I guess wasn't sure why I was so excited I was like dude when the wind's blowing like this you can walk right to them they just don't pay that much attention and uh, it was kind of an overcast night, no moon, so it was real dark. And you, we just walked right up in the middle of them and just flung as many arrows as, as we wanted to. It was a blast. Yeah, I got to do that. Yeah, Cody was all about it. We didn't do it that time because his wife was there, like I said. But he's definitely making some plans, and he'd like to get you guys up there. My buddy's got uh, 30,000 acres that he uh, was able to take hog hunters out at night. We hunt on his place for about four or 500 acres. 
and you know, some blinds and feeders, but when you drive around at night, he's got a lot of property he can drive around on and check out. And, and uh, on those slightly windy nights, it's nice, man. You can get after them, stack them up. Well, it'd be awesome if we all get together. I'd, I, I would really, really like I, I got to hunt with Cody at some point. <laughs> Only be right. It'd be a hoot. You better get your calculator ready and get those percentages dialed in. Yeah, I'm wicked good at math, but all in my head. <laughs> I use a mix of metric, uh, you know, um, what's the other one? Standard? Uh, yeah, but standard, what's what's the other, what's what the common core? Yeah, I use metric, common core, and standard. Mix it all together. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty simple myself. I've been hitting the head with a lot of foul tips, so I'm like, <laughs> you think we should try it? There's an animal. Okay, go for it. And it's either it works or it doesn't. I'm not thinking odds. And I just, it's for me, it's an adventure. I want to go. I'm, I'm more like you, Rob. I want to have fun. Uh, if it works out, it's going to be awesome. We're going to high five. If it doesn't work out, man, you gave it a hell of a time and go around the corner and find something new to get after. That's right. Well, that's how I roll. Yeah, me too. He. I, if I thought as deep into it as him, I would never go on a stock. I wouldn't get out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> Shit me. The numbers he yeah, runs. We need, I, yeah, we need I'm gentlemen impressed like he him. does. No, no, we you. need guys like him to figure out some of the stuff because I don't want to spend the time to research and figure out if I want four fletch or three fetch or this or that. I just need somebody, hey, dude, here's what you need. So I like, I, I bug him all the time. What about this? What about that? Here's what you need. Try this, do this. Okay. That's it. I'm coachable. Keep it simple. That's right. Yep. I bug him about stuff too. Some, especially stuff I'm lazy, too lazy to do myself. Right. Well, dude, well, uh, like I said, we needed just a, uh, an easy BS session. Yeah. You know, we've been, I've been, we've been doing some kind of heavy, uh, heavy podcasts and I just like to shoot the breeze. And uh, you fit the bill, man. Well, we shot a lot of breeze. I can promise you that. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate it. I've really been following you guys, enjoying the trad community and the trad life the last couple of years where I've really delved into it seriously. And I'm literally shooting every night uh, uh, in the backyard, you know, even if it's just, you know, 18 arrows, you know, 10, 20, 30 yards, something like that. And uh, cause I'll shoot a little bit more once the hog season. I'll get back in my tree stand. My neighbors thought I was nuts. I put a tree stand up in a crepe myrtle tree. You ever seen one up in a crepe myrtle? It's pretty <laughs> sketchy. I imagine it's pretty so. sketchy. But I don't have a big firm tree. I can, you know, I could drill a hole and put a telephone pole or get a tripod, I guess, and and stick one in there. But uh, this thing is pretty lightweight, pretty hidden, and the. I got, like I said, I got great neighbors. They've been putting up with me for years and I haven't killed their dog or kids yet. So everything's going well. But uh, once I got up in that tree stand and started shooting, you know, 15, 20 yards elevated. Uh, and I like to shoot sitting down when possible, not always possible, but uh, I've always, it's just that way my legs don't shake. And I just, you know, I can rotate and do what I need to do and stay steady and stay still. My knees are old and tired. I just can't stand that long and let alone stand still and, and be quiet. So anyway, that once I did that, that's when I uh, shot a really big nine point this year. I, he came in and I made, actually I was standing up that time. He, my bow was hanging up. I think I was checking out, checking out Instagram with stick bow chronicles or something to see what those knuckleheads have posted lately. And uh, literally I put my phone up as eight thirty. I said, man, I better get off this phone. I just did it for 10 minutes and reach around and pull my bow off the rack. And here comes a doe with a nice big nine point behind it. So I did get on the board. That's my first wall hanger with the, with the recurve. I'm pretty excited about that. He's at the taxidermy, really nice left side and uh, just a four point on the other side, but beautiful left side. But, I think you reposted it. I appreciate it. I don't think I ever posted a picture of anything. Somebody reposted it. I don't even know what that means, but my son told me it was pretty cool, so thank you for doing that. I didn't win any <laughs> prize, though, but that's okay. I didn't even remember reposting it. Sorry. No. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was such a spectacular. One thing I'm good at is taking some, some good pictures, get down low and get the angle right. Yeah, 
the old big fish story. Now I don't like to stand too far behind them, but it was a beautiful deer. And, and with the recurve, it was just a great, great morning. Well, I really appreciate you guys reaching out to me. Y'all have a great hunt down there in, in Texas and, uh, keep me updated and maybe I'll make one of those trips with you, but definitely when I get healed up, I've got some buddies that got some land and got some hogs. Would love y'all to take a road trip down here and shoot some hogs. Dude, that'd be a you hoot, bet. man. You're not very far from me. I, I'm in Gainesville, so. Oh, that's not far at all. Okay. No, I'm, I'm right, I'm right down the road. Home. Yep. Very cool. You guys are Especially damn near neighbors then? How, how far apart? Tulsa's probably four hours from me. Oh, shoot. Oh, yeah. And where I go hog hunting down south, that's three hours southwest of Tulsa. Hell, down by Wichita Falls, that can't be too far from you. Yeah, that's about an hour and a half. Dude, that's dude, that's in your backyard. Let's do this, man. Yeah, let's do this. Some hog hunt. <laughs> yeah, Rob, not, I think not I just far at all. my new hunt, yeah. buddy. Yeah, <laughs> I got I got all kinds of stuff we can hunt too, so we can oh. trade out. We can trade out. Texas. If I were ever to move from Oklahoma, it'd probably be Texas. There. Uh, if not Colorado, if I no remember. Texas, you might, Texas sucks. Don't come here. You might want to go to Texas. Uh, <laughs> it's becoming a blue state. You you worked on the Biden campaign, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. I tell you that. That being said, man, uh, uh, I just I hope we get our stuff together as a nation, a country. I'm not very political, so I'm not going to get any of that. But I just hope things go. We've got some stuff going on with COVID and the. This and that, man. I'm just rooting for us to have a good four years. The economy's starting to come around. Steel business is starting to come around. Of course, the price of gas is going up a little bit. So hopefully the economy's starting to come around. But until we get this COVID stuff fixed up, man, it's going to be another weird year. A lot of people out, jobs, out of homes, out of apartments. It's sad. So I'm very blessed that I can live in Oklahoma and have a job and sneak out with the kids and buddies and shoot, shoot a few critters and whatnot. Let's get together, man. I'm I'm stoked. I, I want to do this. How long a drive is it for you down? Here? Oh no, I'd be flying. Fly, wouldn't yeah, no, I'd be flying. He could yeah. fly into he could fly into DFW, and that's an hour and a half from my house. I'd pick him up in DFW. Dude, that's that's a no brainer. That is a no. I've been telling him to get down here. I mean, it's you know one of the spots that I that I hog hunt. It's I mean, it's nothing to go out there at 10, 11 o'clock at night and see two or 300 pigs out in some of those fields. It's, it's nuts. That's pretty. And then now with some of these game cameras, we can sit up and watch a ball game and, <laughs> and then check our camera. Oh, there's such and such hog at this feeder. And we don't talk about all my secrets. <laughs> oh, well, that's, <laughs> that's the way those, those game cameras are, they're pretty sick. Yeah, they're they, starting, they, out, starting to outlaw them in certain States. Oh, and I, I, I don't know how my feelings are on that, but I, I know cell cameras kill a lot of, they kill a lot of animals, and uh, I don't know. Wait, we don't need to dive too far off in the weeds on that. But I was talking to my dad the other day, and just telling him. And actually, this was before the trail camera ban thing came around. I was like, you know, it was a lot of fun hunting growing up. Whenever we didn't use trail cameras, because. And the reason being is every time I went and sat, I always thought I was going to see a big buck. Yeah, I didn't no know doubt. where he was going to come from. I didn't know what he looked like because we didn't have trail cameras. We didn't know what was there unless we saw it with our eyes. And every sit, I was on the edge of my seat to see what was going to walk out of that creek bottom or what was going to walk out of the timber. And, and anymore, it's – it's almost taken the fun out of it in a lot of ways. Cause I know what deer are there. I, I, I hardly ever, ever, ever get surprised when I go and sit and you know, we've gotten really good at managing our deer because of trail cameras, shooting the right deer, letting the right deer walk. But on the flip side of that, it's, it's taken some of the fun out of it. And right. you know, I think I, anyway. I don't think you could have said it any better than you said it right there. You know, when you were a kid, you thought every sit you were going to see a big buck. I, I, you, you couldn't have framed it better than that. Well, I mean, that's just the truth. Every time we went and sat in a blind or sat in a tree, it was a roll. It was, it was just a emotional roller coaster the whole time you were sitting there. Every time a twig broke, because it it just 
you never knew what was what was fixing to walk out and it's just different now and that's part of that's part of the reason i really enjoyed hunting that public land up in oklahoma this year and it's a lot of the reason why i've enjoyed hunting in kansas and hunting in colorado and hunting out of state is because i'm just going with a blindfold on and whatever we see when we get there it's just the anticipation and i guess that like in, a lot of people talk about that next ridge mentality like I, I want to top that next ridge let's go see what's over that and it's you know in Oklahoma this year I ran one camera uh got some pictures of some pretty good bucks but hell I didn't even half the time I just went in somewhere new and just went and sat and the whole sit I would be totally engaged in what was going on because I didn't know what was there and it was just it was fun it was refreshing but it sure is nice when you've have one and a big buck pops up on a Wednesday <laughs> evening and you don't have to wait till Saturday to check your trail camera. You just checked it at breakfast and you're like, Hey honey, I'm going hunting tonight. Yep. <laughs> It'll help no, you it's, on the board. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not necessarily complaining and, and I'm not necessarily against trail cameras. It just, I think it's good to have an open mind and kind of call it what it is, you know? I have some buddies uh, that take them down after the rut because of the same reason if they don't see big bucks coming into their feeder pens they don't hunt so like this is ridiculous we come up here to hunt we're taking all the cameras down and we're going to hunt they come in they come in if they don't they don't and that's right. really re rejuvenated them and then, you know maybe a hog comes in maybe a coyote comes in maybe just a doe at least they get out there and they get after them well and people get sucked into especially on these feeders and stuff like that people get sucked into if they're not getting pictures of them they don't think they're there which is a load of crap <laughs> they're there you just have to change your plan well, just like if you have if you have the camera pointed at that feeder, I might keep telling my buddy, man, I haven't seen a big buck. He goes, they're here. Look, the neighbor killed this one. The neighbor killed this one. The kid across the highway killed this one. He's showing me pictures of some freaks. And I was like, you're right, you're right. And that's the same reason why I hunt 100 yards down wind of a feeder sometimes. Those bucks, they don't give a crap about a, a kernel of corn. They're looking for those does, and they can see them from 200 yards away and smell them from a half a mile away. That's all they need to do is cruise, cruise, cruise. You need a good spot with a decoy, but you can't shoot them from the couch. That's right. 100%. 100%. Well, I didn't want to dive too far off into the weeds, but kind of got my uh, noggin lit up there on the trail camera thing. I just That was something that has recently been a topic of discussion and um, on a lot of podcasts, actually, that Arizona trail cam ban. Yeah, um, yeah we, we... That's my experience with trail cameras and how I feel about them is I think they're great in a lot of ways. I also think they take the fun out of some stuff in a lot of ways too. So. And there, there's going to be, even if they ban them, there's going to be ways for them to get around them as you know, because yeah, the farmers that's... can have them, the ranchers can have them. I mean, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be rough for them to litigate that legislate that. The only way they can do it in my opinion is to, ban them ex like statewide you can't have a trail camera period don't care if you're a bird watcher cattle guy whatever you can't yeah, have it the only way yeah. it's the only way you can legislate it to and enforce it to where it makes sense because uh, otherwise if there's any gray area people are going to take advantage of it as they always will yeah cheaters are still going to cheat yeah that's right that but you'll right. never make the hall of fame <laughs> <laughs> We're kicking their ass out. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Right on. Hey, uh, man, it's been a hoot, Rick. Yeah, I we appreciate it, it, man. Hope you, uh, yeah, you uh, get healed up, man. No, I can't wait. I'm working hard, and uh, uh, like I said, you can't shoot them from the couch. Well, guess what? I've been living on the couch for about three weeks, and it's driving me nuts. And I take a little jaunt in the backyard and shoot a few arrows, me and my walker. And uh, they come back in and hit the ice. It's but it'll it'll come along. Hey, you got I'm that? Looking forward to it. You got the that? Hogs are going to be in trouble. I can promise you that. You got that beard you, going. That beard's the same color that I had going on there. You can probably get a crossbow permit. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have. There to we go. Permit. There's oh, another. Yeah. There's another hour and a half. Yeah, don't get me started. I mean, God bless those guys that shoot them and. And we need hunters in the field, but it's it's not archery hunting; it's bow gun hunting. And but uh, there's a place for them. What the hell? They got to kill hogs too. But uh, anyway, I won't be doing it. Not 
not for a long time, hopefully. All right. Let's wrap this. All right. Well, appreciate it, Rick. Thanks for coming on, man. And it was it was good talking to you. We'll stay in touch, and we'll have to get together here soon. That'd be great. Look forward to it. Thank you. All right, buddy. Take care. Yeah, bye-bye.